Tony, should we try roll? Sure, Jimenez. Corrales. Cohen. Here. Brosco. Here. Davis. Here. Esparza. Arenas. Foley. Foley. Here. Just sit here. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> Mahan. Here. Jones. Present. Licardo. Also here. You have six. You have seven people. You have a quorum. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we've got a jam-packed uh, calendar this evening. So I'm, uh, with apologies to the members of the public and community who would like to speak, but I'm going to, to uh, reduce public comment to one minute to make sure we can get to all these items before midnight. Uh, so we'll begin with item 8.3, which is the final public hearing on the fiscal year 2020, I'm sorry, 22-23 annual action plan for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, and I see Reagan is here. Uh, the public hearing is open. And Reagan, you don't have any further presentation, I assume. Hi, Mayor. Reagan Henning with the Housing Department. I have no uh, presentation, but if I could just make a brief opening Please do. Comment. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to point out to the mayor and council's attention a supplemental that was published today for this item. And the reason for the supplemental is uh, HUD has uh, decreased our community development block grant or CDBG funding by about 5% and our emergency solutions grant funding by about 2%. In the original uh, memo for this item this evening, we proposed a 5% decrease for the CDBG public service item uh, contracts. And we have since identified a funding source to make up that difference for those contracts. And so the supplemental identifies those contracts and the, that we'll be restoring them to their uh, funding levels with no decrease. Thank, thank you for notifying us, Reagan. I actually didn't see that supplemental, so I appreciate you bringing, bringing that to our attention. Um, is there an explanation for the change in the funding formula offered by HUD? Um, it, it's, it's a little puzzling because our CDBG and ESG were reduced, but our home and our HOPWA funds received an increase. Um, huh. So I'm not sure why, why that was. Okay. All right. We'll uh, we'll check in with our federal lobbyists and and figure that out. Okay. So we do have a public hearing at this time. Um, Tony. John Orlando. Let me just clarify. We're on eight point three, which is the annual HUD action plan. John. I'm going to move on to Blair. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thank you for this item and that you're still having uh, public hearings about it and your newest explanations. Uh, I, you know, you know my uh, regular routine, how to talk about items like this at this time. Uh, how can we talk about uh, the future of subsidies openly? and make it a safe conversation for ourselves, how to uh, address the future of subsidy in, in San Jose and across the state uh, at this time. We, we have many more choices. It's important that we, I mean, it offers choices, you know, towards ideas of housing that we've been trying to prepare for for years, if not decades. So it's so vital that we practice good organization uh, and organize ourselves in practices that we've studied all our lives for, basically. <laughs> and now the, these things are here and we can do things. And it's just a matter of setting down our... Back to the council. All right. Um, do you need a motion at this point, Reagan? Or... I think you can close the public hearing and then we do need a motion to approve the proposed... 22, 23 annual action. Plan. Okay, thanks. The public hearing is closed. 
make a motion to uh, approve the uh, the plan. Second. Councilmember Cohen. Uh, just I just have one quick question on the list of um, proposed amounts on the table in the in the memo. It was there was a health trust amount, and that's not in the table in the supplemental. Can you just explain that? Yeah, um, the health trust and another organization, um, POSO, uh, they provide senior nutrition services and they're funded out of the public service um, category for CDBG. And at the, um, we received some uh, direction from our Housing and Community Development Commission when we took the proposed annual plan to them that they wanted to see an increase in the senior um, nutrition programs funding rather than a decrease because they were worried about seniors who are on uh, very limited incomes um, who can't access food anywhere else and were worried about with inflation seniors not being able to have access to uh, Recording program. in progress. So the Housing Commission recommended an increase. So we are increasing funding to the Health Trust and POSO. Um, and then, as I said, in, in that supplemental, we'll be bringing up the other organizations to their current funding level. No decrease. So the, the numbers in the original memo for POSO and Health Trust have not changed, and that's why it's not in the table in the supplemental? That's right. Oh, okay, okay. Councilman, do you have any other questions? Nope. Okay. All right. Uh, I don't see any other hands up, so let's vote. Jimenez? Morales? Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Hi, Davis. Yes. Esparza Arenas. Yes. Aye. Mahan. Aye. Jones. Aye. Ricardo. Aye. All right. Uh, item ten point one is the land use consent calendar. I think there are a couple items there, including um, conformance under state law. Is there any public comment on 10.1, the land use consent calendar? Um, yeah, I have um, Kun Zhang in person. Kun Zhang? Kun Zhang, please come up to the microphone. The podium. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, thank you for uh, hosting the public hearing. Um, I'm just, uh, my name is Kun Zhang. I live in uh, uh, adjacent uh, North Lake neighborhood. Um, I really object the rezoning proposed in file number uh, C22032 and uh, 036 because I fail to see how much the rezoning will serve and benefit our existing community. And this new, new zone will aggravate unbearable noise pollution, definitely, because uh, uh, just uh, recent, uh, uh, we got some pollution exposure and noise, noise exp pollution exposure on May 24th because of the you know, related uh, utility project. Uh, I can play the noise here in person, just let like you hear for 10 seconds. But I sustain for that noise uh, for almost eight hours. And uh, also, the, it's going to cause the scarcity of the parking in the region, which is right now for both street side currently already fully packed with neighborhood vehicles. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Your time is up. I'm moving. Um, that was my only in-person speaker for this item. Okay, thank you. And for the, for the record, I'll oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was, I'm moving to Zoom. Okay, 
I would just think for the record, I, I believe the member of the public was speaking to item A, 10.1A, relating, relating to uh, um, the rezoning of properties in the Stevens Creek Boulevard and Surfing Avenue. All right, thank you. Um, Blair? Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, to quickly offer, uh, you know, as what I usually do on this sort of item, the future of rezoning uh, towards urban village projects. I don't think it should be fast tracked. I think each urban village thing has to have a lot of uh, community dialogue and 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 talk and uh, and and just uh, they shouldn't get a free pass with the future of subsidy planning. Uh, we really have to be considering extremely low, very low, and mixed income ideas in the future of urban uh, village planning. And they, I, this just tends to run towards more high end uh, planning. I wanted to uh, offer uh, open uh, the future of open public policies and its civil protection ideas are really important for the transit issues and, and the planning of these urban village futures. Uh, don't forget the importance of civil protections and open public policies really help organize ourselves well. And uh, to conclude, um, procedurally, we're supposed to have open forum at this time for the previous consent for the con previous agenda items. Uh, what, what happened with that? Thank you. Paul? Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. That's exactly right with those consent items. Uh, I mean, with the open forum and the fact that you asked the question there and Nora Freeman went ahead and just said, it, yeah, 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 that's how we do it. No, you go by the agenda. And what the agenda says is we were just deprived of a constitutional right, and we would deprive democracy from that open forum. Okay, so that, let's just put that on the table, because that's clear. Secondly, to the item, you guys are putting nothing but cars over there in these urban villages. Well, at, well, at the same time, you have the audacity to say that, oh, well, we need to take cars off the road. We need to take cars off the road. You ain't taking no cars off the road. Every single market rate housing development has a parking space for it. And then you get people like Alex Shore to come in here and give his, 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 his. Back to council. All right, back to council. Council member Cohen, was that from before? Hear your hand up. Okay, uh, Vice Mayor Jones. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and uh, I, I just uh, would like to staff to help me uh, clarify things with the public. I, I actually haven't seen the cards that go out and notify the public of um, these changes, uh, but I've gotten feedback, and there's a misconception uh, that um, this is, there's an actual project that's going to happen. So can you, one, kind of give us an idea of what goes out to the public and what we can do to in the future to not have these uh, misunderstandings. Thank you, Vice Mayor Chris Burton, uh, Director of Planning, Building and Code Enforcement. Um, I don't have an example of the card with me. I apologize. I will follow up and provide one. Um, after, so just to step back for a second, this is the ongoing process associated with uh, SB 1333 to rezone all of the parcels in the city that are inconsistent with the underlying general plan land use. Um, so we're going through a, a process to uh, update the zoning on uh, approximately 13,000 properties right now um, mm -hmm. throughout the city. And as we'd previously discussed uh, with one of these items coming through, um, we did have some concerns about some of the notification and some of the messaging that was going out. We did update the postcard that is sent to members of the public within uh, the surrounding area. Um, we can certainly take another look at that and make it sort of very clear that this is not associated with a development project. It's really just to come into consistency with state law um, between the two land use designations that we have. Yeah, maybe even put it in bold letters. You know, <laughs> this is not a project. Yeah. Just a notification for rezoning or something to that effect. But, it, you know, if you want to work with uh, my office or any other council offices to kind of work on some of the wording, you know, we can support that. Thank you. And so I will make a, a motion to accept uh, item 10.1. Second. All right, thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor, for attempting to put the concerns of, I think, one, one concerned member of the public at ease, um, but there's 
no imminent construction. We're simply looking to ensure we conform with state law. All right, uh, let's vote on the consent calendar. Morales? Yes. Owen? Aye. Um, Davis? Yes. Ms. Barza? Yes. Ines? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Tony, this is Carrasco. Aye. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Item uh, 10.3 is a special use permit investing tentative map for the project site at 605 Bl Blossom Hill Road. I believe there's going to be a presentation and then we'll have the applicant for five minutes and then we will go to the public. Thank you, Mayor Chris Burton, Director of Planning, Building Code Enforcement. I'm going to hand it over to uh, our acting supervising planner for this project, uh, Laura Miners. Thank you, Mayor and City Council members, and thank you, Chris. This is Laura Miners, the Planning Project Manager for this request for a special use permit to allow the development of a 5.39 acres within the southern and eastern portion of the 7.42. Is this how you hmm? okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, for this special use permit to allow the development of 5.39 acres within the southern and eastern portions of the 7.42 acre site with a signature project for policy IP 5.10 of the San Jose general plan, including the demolition of existing. I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we can barely hear you. So you might need to take your mask down. Okay. Yeah, it, it's okay. certainly acceptable if you'd like to take your mask off so that way you can be heard and then put it back on. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, including the demolition of existing surface parking the removal of 55 ordinance sized trees and 14 non ordinance trees and the construction of one six story mixed use building with 13,590 square feet of commercial space and 239 market rate multifamily residential units and one five story multifamily residential building with 89 affordable housing units with improvements to the Canoas Creek Trail and extended construction hours to include Saturdays from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And a vesting tentative map to merge the existing two lots on the approximately 7.42 gross acre project site to one lot and subdivide into five lots for the mixed use development described above, located north of Blossom Hill Road, approximately 300 feet easterly of Chesbro Avenue located at 605 Blossom Hill Road. The subject site is currently developed with a 542 space surface parking lot to support the adjacent Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority, BTA Blossom Hill Light Rail Station, BTA Bus Stop, Landscaping, and Ornamental Trees. The project site is bordered by State Route 85 to the north, and the exit ramp to the east. Uh, the Blossom Hill VTA station is also located to the north of the site, and the VTA light rail runs down the center of SR85 with access to the Blossom Hill station provided at the project site. Located south of the project site is Blossom Hill Road, a six lane street divided by a median. Directly across Blossom Hill Road from the project site is Samaritan Medical Care Center, a medical office use. To the west is the Canoas Creek riparian area, and to the other side of the creek are one and two story single family residences and a small retail commercial building facing Blossom Hill Road. The site is within the neighborhood community commercial general plan land use designation and within the Blossom Hill Road Cahillan Avenue Urban Village Plan area, not yet adopted. 
the project is currently zoned agriculture and this housing project is implementing state law AB 3194 to be reviewed under the CP commercial pedestrian zoning district with no rezone application required. Mixed use projects are allowed with signature project conformance per general plan policy IP-5.10. The project is consistent with all relevant general plan policies, zoning ordinance standards, and council development policies. At this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to David Keon, the environmental project manager to discuss the CEQA process. Good evening, members of the City Council. David Keon, Principal Planner on the City's Environmental Review Team. I want to brief, briefly go over the EIR that was prepared for this project. Um, the Environmental Impact Report was circulated for 45 days between March 10th and April 25th, 2022. Um, there was one significant and unavoidable impact identified, and that was because the vehicle miles traveled exceeds the City's threshold even with mitigation measures. Therefore, this project would require a statement of overriding consideration. Um, less than significant impacts of mitigations were also identified related to air quality, construction air quality, biological resources, cultural resources, hazards, construction noise, and vibration. Um, several comments were received on the draft EIR related to soil testing standards, potential for lead in the soil, um, transportation demand management measures, um, ADA compliance, um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife permitting, removal of trees, lighting impacts, and loss of parking for the Boston Hill Station. The city responded to all these comments and posted these responses to the city's website on July 1st, 2022. Um, none of the comments raised issues that would require recirculation of the draft EIR, and therefore the city is recommending that this, we are recommending the city council certify the draft environmental impact report. Thank you. I pass it on to back, back to Laura for the recommendation. Thank you, David. Therefore, staff recommends that the planning, uh, excuse me, the city council recommend approval of the special use permit and vesting tentative map um, and certification of the environmental impact report in accordance with CEQA. That is the end of our presentation. Thank you very much. All right, uh, let's go to the applicant. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor Licardo, Vice Mayor Jones, and members of the council. My name is Melissa Durkin, Senior Vice President of Development with Republic Urban Properties here on behalf of the Green Republic Bar Blossom Hill Partnership, made up of Republic Urban Properties as the master developer and developer of the mixed use market rate 
um, apartment building, EAH Housing, the affordable housing developer, and Swenson, the project architect and general contractor. Here tonight and via Zoom, we also have Daniel Ryan, the associate director of real estate with EAH Housing, and our partners with the VTA, Jesse O'Malley Solis, their TOD development program manager, and Kelly Snyder, project manager. We are pleased to be presenting our project to the city council tonight and want to first thank staff for all of their hard work. In 2018, the VTA issued a request for proposals for the Blossom Hill Light Rail Station as part of its transit, transit development oriented program. The objectives for their program include providing long-term stable revenue to support their transit operations, increasing transit ridership, providing on-site affordable housing with a deeper level of affordability and units that can accommodate families, community involvement, creating a vibrant, high-quality mixed-use development, enhancing station access with an emphasis on pedestrian and bicycle safety, and later that year, the Green Republic team was awarded the project. The site is within the Blossom Hill Cahalan Urban Village Plan area and is proceeding as a signature project since the Urban Village Plan has not yet been adopted. We believe that we are meeting the signature project criteria and that we are providing jobs through over 13,000 square feet of ground floor commercial space, including pu publicly accessible open space in the form of plazas, paseos, and trails. We're creating a pedestrian friendly design through wide and tree lined sidewalks, paseos, and trails. We've conducted several community meetings throughout the entitlement process and are providing high quality architecture for both the market rate and affordable building. The development proposal includes a 239 unit market rate building with over 13,000 square feet of ground floor retail space fronting Blossom Hill Road. There's an 89 unit affordable housing building for households earning between 30 and 60% of the area median income, which equates to about 27% of the overall total unit count. There's approximately two acres of public open space and the remainder of the site will be used for transit parking. Community benefits include a new 0.8 mile class a bike and pedestrian trail that will connect blossom hill road to the existing trail network at marshall coddle park with two new trailheads and a historical plaque we're increasing safety by adding daytime and nighttime population as well as improved on-site lighting the neighborhood serving retail provides opportunity for coffee shops cafes restaurants or other personal services there's also a dedicated 800 square foot community room with outdoor courtyard in the market rate building that the surrounding neighborhood can use for meetings and event space similar to a community center. The plazas are designed to accommodate community events and gatherings. New bus stops and shelters are proposed along Blossom Hill Road. And finally, there's an overall improved transit rider experience. The architecture that's proposed is a modern Spanish style design that's timeless and also unique for this location. You can see that both buildings incorporate similar colors, materials, and special architectural details. We paid special attention to the ground floor to create an enhanced pedestrian experience. We're also including large murals um, that show local flora and fauna that will be designed by a local San Jose artist on several of the elevations. And thank you for your consideration. Okay, further staff? No, okay, we'll go to the public. Jesse O'Malley. Good evening, City Council and Mayor. My name is Jesse O'Malley Solis, and I'm VTA's TOD program manager. VTA is the long term ground lessor for the property located at Blossom Hill Station. And I want to recognize the great work of staff on bringing this EIR and special use permit forward to hearing tonight. We've worked closely with the project sponsor and applicant over the past few years. And they've done a great job to increase affordable housing on site to over 25% of the units 
bringing much needed affordable housing to our community. The project will boost system ridership by between 235 and 250 new daily riders. And the project will result in public art, a new transit plaza and greater bike and pedestrian connectivity. Developments like this is, are what we need to help address global and regional climate change impacts. And we hope you'll support this item tonight. Thank you. Hey, Jesse, could I just ask you to stay on the line for a minute or two after public comment so we could ask a question? Thank you. Yes, much. absolutely. Thanks, Jesse. <clears throat> Catherine Hedges. Catherine. Okay, I'm going to move on to Paul Soto. Yeah, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. What I'd like to know is what do you determine is affordable when this housing unit is built? I'm not talking about right now. Statistically, you have that information, you have that data. I want to know what the projected median income is going to be at the time of the projected completion of this unit. That's number one. Number two, that I want every single one of those market rate housings, give them a bus pass and send them on the VTA. No cars, absolutely no parking lots, nothing. If we're going to go uh, uh, climate clean and we're going to go with no cars and all that rhetoric that we just heard earlier, then you know what? Let's start at the market rate housings. Number three, we need to start putting a cap on market rate housing if we're ever going to catch up with the lower classes being. Alex, Alex Shore. Hey, this is Alex with Catalyze SV. Want to thank VTA Republic EH Housing for bringing this project forward to you all. Our members scored it a four out of five. So much to like here with this project. We love the trail access, the vibrancy that it will bring, the focus on transit riders and affordable housing, the mixed use qualities to it, just uh, the community room, a lot of great things. As I alluded to earlier, we would love to see VTA or the city provide transit passes as part of this project to residents to again invest in our infrastructure, our resource, our transit system that we want to be successful. So the transit first policy was passed earlier today. Here's a way to implement it to encourage the developer to help people. Blair? Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, just a friendly reminder, uh, you know, uh, the VTA City of Santa Clara and uh, uh, San Jose, they all know how to do, you know, been learning ideas of what, to, what are mixed income ideas. Uh, good luck how that, the mixed income ideas can be of help here for this project. As Paul Soto very nicely mentioned, uh, can you talk about exactly what will be the levels of affordable housing offered? Uh, to bring in extremely low and very low income, along with mixed income, can be vitally important for this project. You guys know how to do these things already, as I described, and uh, it's learning how to really bring that to, to the forefront at this time. Good luck how to do it with a project like this. Thank you. Catherine? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm a member of Catalyze SV, and um, this is a really good project. I wish they had been able to bring in more units at lower levels of affordability. And it's unfortunate that the funding structure disincentivizes developers from combining the market rate and affordable housing in the same building. Um, but this is a really well-designed project and we were very impressed with uh, many features of it. So I hope it's approved. Thank you. Brian Darby. Thank you. I just, I don't know if this is the right place. I was here at the other, when they were having the affordable housing. Several of the students I work with are looking to move and it's within the time frame. Who decides, or how do you decide, how do you get into the affordable housing? Um, if, if somebody could address that, I've been trying to get a hold of people at the city 
and I don't get any of that information. I really, the project looks really nice. Um, and it, it seems like everybody's really going overboard. To, I mean it not that way, going beyond what's required in order to meet the needs of the affordable people who need affordable housing in this area. But just to, how do you get on those lists? So what's the procedure? And I'm starting this early because oftentimes it takes that long to go through the list. Thank you. Daniel Ryan. Hi, this is Daniel Ryan, uh, Associate Director with EAH Housing, the uh, developer of the affordable building for this project. Just wanted to answer a few comments that have been posed. Um, as Melissa pointed out, uh, the proposed AMI levels are between 30 and 60% AMI. Uh, currently, we're looking at uh, about 66 actually percent uh, at 30% um, AMI with the remaining 33% uh, being at, um, so sorry, two thirds at 30% and one third at 60% uh, AMI. And uh, the, to answer the question regarding wait lists, um, you know, once the buildings are near completion, oftentimes affordable housing, or, uh, affordable housing developments will release a wait list in which people can apply. And it's usually a lottery system. And then those who are not uh, selected in the lottery will be on the wait list. Thank you. Back to council. Uh, thank you. Thanks to members of the community who weighed in. Council Member Mahan. Great. Thank you, Mayor. And I will, um, I'll be quick, but, uh, you know, we don't get a whole lot of new housing projects in District 10. So we've got we to stop and really celebrate the ones that we do get, especially uh, when they're such excellent projects. So I want to thank uh, Republic Urban, Melissa, and Michael and the team for bringing this project forward and their partners at EAH, Swenson, and VTA. I know it's been quite a journey to get here. In fact, I first attended a community meeting envisioning you know, the project and what it could contain, I think over three years ago now, because it was in my neighborhood and I was interested. So it was before I ran for council. And um, I really wanna, I wanna thank my predecessor, Councilor Camus and his office for supporting the project and, and uh, the work that their team did along with the community to ensure that we incorporate some of that great feedback that the community gave us early on in the project. I recently checked in with neighborhood leaders in Playa del Rey and Comanche, the neighborhoods on either side of the project, and uh, folks like Bob Vonderworth, Eldon Nichols, Roxanne and Greg Koopman, and they're all really excited about the project, in, in particular, the fact that it incorporates a community room in an, a part of our district that doesn't have a lot of public space. And so this is a, a place where their neighborhood associations can meet, which is really, really awesome to see. The trail that connects this side of 85 to this incredible amenity of Marshall Cottle Park on the other side is um, extremely exciting. And so uh, I just, I really wanna thank Republic for moving forward with these incredible community uh, amenities incorporated into the project. The fact that it's truly mixed use and mixed income with the affordable housing being done on site is also extremely exciting. And then finally, I, I wanna thank our team, Chris Burton, Robert Manford, Laura Miners and, and, and others and their colleagues at VTA Valley Water and the county who I know had to do quite a bit of collaboration to figure out that trail and some of the other components of this, of this project. So these are the kinds of projects we wanna see, mixed use, mixed income, near transit with, with community amenities like this. And we need to do everything in our power to streamline these even more in the future but uh, excited that we're moving forward tonight. I'm really looking forward to seeing you all break ground on this project. And with that, would like to move acceptance of the uh, resolution so we can move this forward. Motion from Council Member Mahan. Uh, is there a second? Second. I'll second, okay. Council Member Foley, we'll second. Great. Um, just that I don't see other hands up. First, I want to thank uh, all the partners, uh, Green Republic and uh, I guess Republican Urban, uh, EAH on the affordable site, and uh, Swenson and the VTA, of course, and uh, Councilmember Mayhan and his team and, and our planning team. Um, I had a couple questions though, and I guess the first is how do we end up with a site or a project that has a measurable impact? of increasing VMT on a piece of land owned by VTA at a VTA light rail station, TOD right on a trail. 
Um, Good evening, Mayor. Um, David Kahn, Principal Planner, Cities and Environment Review Team. So the City Council Policy 5-1 lays out the city's vehicle miles traveled policy, and then that there's thresholds for what would trigger a VMT impact. Right. And if I could actually bring on Manjeet um, Benawait. Um, she is on the Zoom link. Um, she could speak more in more detail about it, but specifically what happened is that when that council that council policy was adopted it is based upon the vmt in the area and it did not take into consideration items like proximity to transit when you're in higher vmt areas but i can bring on my g if you want or I, I well before we go there i guess that 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 seems like a fundamental flaw doesn't it uh that we won't take into account proximity to a transit station when we're calculating vehicle miles travel yeah and and also, so DOT and planning are working on an update of the policy okay, to address this. And that is actually part of the next vehicle miles travel update. We are taking that in consideration because the state law does allow um, projects within a certain radius of high quality transit to be considered um, exempt from BMT, depending okay. on the type of project. So yes, that is definitely something that is being looked at as part of this current update. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. Um, is there a reason why, again, we're on a VTA site next to a light rail station? Why isn't there a commitment of VTA transit passes? Speaking of VMT issues. <laughs> and I guess maybe it's a question for Jesse Nysalis. Um, Jesse, is there a reason why VTA wouldn't, as a matter of policy, simply say, if you're going to build transit oriented development on our sites next to our transit stations, as a builder, you're going to have to commit at least for some period of time, some duration. For the issuance of transit passes to your residents so that way residents are actually using this multi-billion dollar transit system that taxpayers have paid for um good evening there's no doubt that we're interested in gaining ridership from developments like this um, as we are approaching near ground breakings on sites like this and and other sites within our portfolio we're gonna be sitting down and really thinking about how do we market and make um, transit passes accessible to all of the new residents at these locations. And so um, we are in the process of sitting down and looking at how do we market that in a way that's accessible to folks. And um, I would say stay tuned and we're working on it. Okay, so there's no policy now, is that right, Jesse? That's right. There's no current policy requiring it. And I can't even remember. I know we've talked about our development policy several times at the board. Was this ever raised or was there a reason why we decided not to do this? We, if you recall, we recently brought our transit oriented development policy to the board in June. Um, this item was not raised. I will certainly flag it as something that needs to be addressed in the policy going forward. Okay. Well, then I, I guess at the very least, you know, to the partners at EAH, is there a reason? I mean, we commonly see in affordable projects at the very least that there would be a commitment for transit passes. Is EAH inclined to, to do that here? I, I know there's a gentleman here who spoke for EAH online. I don't know if he's uh, Daniel, I believe. Are you able to be? Uh... Yes, I'm here. Can you hear okay, me? Okay, great. Hi, Daniel. Hi. Uh, thank you, Mayor Licardo. Uh, yes, yeah, so we are obviously quite interested in finding a way to provide uh, transit passes to our residents. Uh, the most obvious way is um, funding through the AHSC program at the state. And it is something that we've looked into a lot. Um, that program is fantastic, but not a given. So it is something that we'll be going after and we'll be looking for other means to provide that. But, uh, but until we find a, a type of subsidy or um, a program that can help fund that, uh, we can't fund that out of cash flow given the low 
uh, income of the residents at this property. So we will continue to look for that, but at this time can't promise it until we uh, receive an award that will allow us to do so. It sounds like the answer is no. Um, the, the answer is we're trying to uh, get there, but we have not received any funding commitments that will allow for it yet. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I think, did you wanna speak about the market rate project? Point um, about transit subsidies. We do have um, an approved TDM plan through the city. And in that plan, we do meet our vehicle mile reduction. So we are gonna have an on-site TDM coordinator that can help facilitate um, transit, share information on schedules and the bus system, light rail, help with carpooling. So we are really interested in promoting public transportation, um, but it's through these other TDM measures. I, I guess I'd say this feels like an indictment of our TDM itself, because I can't imagine the residents at any of these projects saying, boy, am I glad I have a TDM coordinator, but I can't afford to ride light rail. And wouldn't it be nice if we actually had passes since this is VTA land or right next to a VTA light rail station. So I guess I'm kind of puzzled between all the participants how we could not the city, the VTA, an affordable builder and a market rate builder, we couldn't come up with some approach that would enable and I assume it would come out of the land value ultimately for VTA an approach that would enable there to be passes when, as David just explained, this actually exceeds our VMT policy, <laughs> presumably because we don't have enough mitigation. <laughs> am I, I mean, Chris, am I missing something? <clears throat> no, Mayor, I think it's a, a, a very fair question. I think, you know, as we approach the project, we're obviously trying to balance um, the various different options that occur through our TDM policy and the way we address it through the CEQA process which ultimately then does push it back between, you know, the property owner and the developer on, on their consideration of costs around how they provide those passes. So, so we don't always have the sort of the mechanism to ensure that we're uh, requiring those passes. Um, certainly, you know, it's encouraged through everything we do, but um, yeah. as we look at the updates to 5-1, as we look at the updates that'll come to the TDM policy, these are certainly things that we'll take into consideration through that process. When is that gonna come back to the council? 5-1 comes, uh, I want to say later. And yeah, it's, I think they're both coming in the fall. Okay. As I believe it, yeah. Well, I look forward to that because I think we as a city need to be tougher, <laughs> especially on a VTA site. I think VTA needs to be more committed as well. And I hope, Jesse, there's an opportunity to bring that back to the board uh, because this, you know, fundamentally undermines an awful lot of what we're trying to accomplish in the city. Um, and I, I know that, you know, there'd be opportunity for more density as well. And I, I just feel like we're missing that opportunity. Um, can I ask also, Jesse, just about the remaining parking spaces between the development site and the light rail station? Are those gonna be just reserved for light rail riders? Um, <clears throat> our, park, our transit parking lots are generally open to the public. Um, we do, the site is serviced both by bus and light rail. Um, people could also park there and commute together or carpool together. Those are common uses between our transit park and ride lots. Um, we have historically had um, corporate shuttles that pick up and drop off at our sites as well. And um, this site, pre-pandemic was a popular location for that. Yeah. When, when we were analyzing the amount of parking that needed to be maintained, we took a look at pre-pandemic and future ridership growth anticipated at the site. And so the amount of parking that we're requiring to maintain on site is sufficient for both pre-pandemic uses and growth in the future. Is there an opportunity for VTA to allow for development of the air rights above that parking so the parking could be continued to use for a VTA but we could maximize the use of that land if 
I missed the beginning of that, but I believe you're asking about air rights on top of the parking. Yeah, that's I, right. I certainly um, believe that the parking lot and um, potential decking is an opportunity for a future phase, not just at this location, but at many of our BTA park and ride lots in the future. Okay, I look forward to that. Okay, thank you very much. All right, any other questions? All right, there's a motion on the floor. Let's vote. Jimenez? Jimenez? Yeah, yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Lucardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Item 10.4 uh, is the Cambrian number 37. Uh, annexation and plan development zoning for the property at 14200 Union Avenue. And uh, we have a presentation first. We do, Mayor. I can uh, be relatively brief. Um, but let me start just uh, while the presentation is coming up and just express our gratitude um, internally, certainly for Council Member Foley and her staff and all the work they've done with the development team uh, and the community, uh, May, I know your staff have been heavily involved, as well as all of our partner departments uh, throughout the city development services team and the, the city attorney's office, um, and then in particularly uh, our planning team, uh, who are represented tonight, again, by Laura Miners, who's been our project manager, and David Keon, who's been working in the uh, environmental, and John Tu, um, uh, who's our acting division manager, um, and Robert, obviously, and I'd also like to uh, express gratitude for Rosalind for her continued support. This is a project that's five years in the making. Um, so we're very pleased to finally bring this forward for your consideration. Um, so just to talk a little bit about um, our hearing process. So tonight um, before you, we have uh, three components. Uh, firstly, the approval of the environmental impact report, the approval of the pre-zoning of the property, um, and then the initiation of the annexation uh, as we're moving this property from the county into the city. Um, and that's why we have a pre-zoning as opposed to a, uh, a rezoning, just to set the standards um, in advance. We'll be back on September 13th um, to order that annexation with the county. It will then be uh, coordinated and uh, approved or certified uh, through LAFCO. And then we uh, plan to have the actual plan development permit and the tentative map come back to a director's hearing uh, subsequent to, to those approvals. So just as a reminder, um, this is the area that we're considering in the annexation. It's made up of two parcels uh, currently in the county of Santa Clara that we'll be bringing into the city of San Jose. Um, the annexation incorporates about uh, just under 20 acres. Um, the project site is about 18 of those acres. Um, <clears throat> And oh, sorry, it's going too quick. And as noted, um, the pre-zoning uh, will be based on a site-specific plan development zoning district um, based on the commercial pedestrian zoning district. It will allow up to 428 units, residential units, and 350,000 square feet of commercial space that will include a hotel, assisted living, and ground floor retail. Um, there'll be a minimum of four acres of privately owned public uh, privately owned and publicly accessible open space, associated parking, landscaping, and site amenities. Um, we're providing uh, the conceptual site layout, so this will be approved through uh, the subsequent development permit, but the standards of the uh, site-specific zoning district um, conform and incorporate these. Um, the, the proposed project is consistent with the general plan land use designation of neighborhood community commercial. Um, as noted, it's currently unincorporated lands, so uh, it doesn't currently have a city zoning district, but uh, as noted, we'll be bringing that forward as the pre-zoning for a, a plan development zone. Um, with regards to the environmental review, a draft environmental impact report was circulated on November 12th of last year. Um, we received 36 comment letters. Uh, the EIR, identif EIR identified no significant or unavoidable impacts. There were less than significant impacts with mitigation measures incorporated that included construction air quality, biological resources, cultural resources, hazards and hazard material, hazardous materials, uh, and construction and operational noise and vibration. Um, the 
First Amendment to the draft EIR was posted on the city's website on July 1st of this year and included responses to comments. Um, at this time, no recirculation of the EIR is necessary. So finally, staff's recommendation uh, is to firstly adopt a resolution certifying the environmental impact report, impact report and make uh, appropriate findings concerning the mitigation measures and alternatives and adopting the mitigation monitoring and reporting program in accordance with CEQA. Secondly, approve an ordinance pre-zoning the approximately 18 acre site um, in the Santa Clara County unincorporated territory designated as Cambrian number 37 into the CPPD plan development zoning district. And then lastly, adopt a resolution initiating proceedings and scheduling uh, for the September 13th city council meeting, uh, the consideration of the reorganization of territory designated as Cambrian number 37. Uh, which involves annexation into the city of San Jose uh, of the approximately 19.92 acres from the county of Santa Clara. And with that, the team's available for questions. Thanks, Chris. Okay, uh, we'll hear from the applicant and then we'll go to members of the public. Welcome. All set? Mm -hmm. All right. Hello, Honorable Mayor Licardo, um, Vice Mayor Jones, um, Council Member Foley, and other esteemed members of the City Council. I am Michael Straz. Um, I am the Vice President of Development um, for the Western US, for the Western region for Kimco Realty. And this wonderful project comes under my purview. Um, it is a, a pleasure and a privilege to uh, address you this evening about our application to transform Cambrian Park Plaza uh, into a wonderful meeting place and a treasure for the community for generations to come. Uh, Kimco acquired the Cambrian Park Plaza Shopping Center um, property um, when we merged with Weingarten Realty Investors uh, in, uh, in 2021. Um, I will be here to answer any questions along with uh, Kimco's development consultant, Sean Morley, uh, and key members of our design team. Um, let me, uh, in the interim, let me uh, hand over the microphone to our architect, Ken Rodriguez, to walk you through the project. Thank you so much. Good evening, members of the of council, Ken Rodriguez. I'm just going to go through a few slides and we'd be happy to answer any questions. This is the overall master plan that shows uh, the corner building at uh, Union Avenue and uh, Cambrian, building one. It's a combination mixed use uh, project retail on the ground floor, apartments uh, above, and a beautiful uh, center plaza space that will have two uh, uh, food service restaurant, retail buildings located in the center that visually connects all the way through the project and uh, the park and onto uh, the surrounding neighborhood community at Wyrick. Um, to the east side of that building too is a uh, hotel um, site uh, that's located on Camden. Uh, building three, a uh, assisted living project located on Union Avenue. And then to the south side is a combination of townhomes and, uh, and single family residential. Um, we have a center community park space, uh, roughly two acres that sort of anchors the entire site and continues to uh, be sort of the hub of the, uh, uh, of the project. Um, a few uh, renderings here. This is a view from the corner of Camden and Union looking through to that plaza space that I talked about. You can see the retail on the ground floor, outdoor dining seating areas that, that uh, address the street edge, as well as interior um, uh, dining and, uh, and spaces that'll be located in the plaza. We have a unique element on this project, the combination uh, bike lane so, um, and separated bike lane and, um, and sidewalk project, uh, again, to further promote both pedestrian activity for the neighborhood as well as bicycling. Uh, this is a, a slide of the center plaza space that I spoke of with the two small buildings, outdoor dining, series of water features, uh, unique planting, and then the uh, residential project uh, surrounding it, looking down on it. Um, a view from uh, basically, Wyrick Avenue, as you enter the project from um, uh, our neighbor, uh, surrounding neighbor at the south, 
and looking back out at this open space, you can see the hotel building on the right, the mixed use uh, project in the center, um, and then the assisted living that would be on the left hand side, all looking out onto this beautiful park space um, that it could be used for multiple functions. Uh, this is a view from a new private street that we're creating that connects uh, Union to uh, Camden through the project. It's the only real public street circulation piece that we have. Um, single family homes and a uh, small uh, tot lot that will be right back at the Wyrick entry. Um, this is a view from uh, Camden Avenue looking west. Uh, of the hotel project. As you can see, it has a very nice urban edge, outdoor dining from the restaurants, um, and again, the lobby uh, space, uh, encouraging pedestrian traffic off of uh, Camden. You can see the separated bike lane and the pedestrian connection here and how wide that is, and we, we hope to be uh, and help uh, promote uh, a lot of uh, pedestrian activity and bicycle activity along this 17-acre site. Union Avenue frontage, um, we are relocating the historic sign, um, one of the really iconic pieces of, of the Cambrian Park community. And um, it will be located in a park, a new park that would be uh, built, private park on uh, Union Avenue. You can see the townhome project to the right, the assisted living project to the left, and then the larger mixed use project at the corner, retail on the ground floor and residential up above. Um, we have had a lot of uh, local support. More than 600 residents have pledged support for the project, plus a strong coalition of local uh, organizations. Some are listed here. And um, uh, last but not least, the city came up with some beautiful design goals um, that sort of drove this project. And uh, in many, many community outreach meetings, um, these were finalized, put together, and are a big part of the overall plan. Uh, our our, our uh, friends of, uh, of Cambrian um, um, came up with their own unique plan, which we uh, really appreciated, we enjoyed, and have had many meetings with their team uh, putting together this final project. It meets a lot of the goals from their plan. We included it, and you can see that it is somewhat similar uh, with a center park uh, retail on the corner, uh, both a hotel and assisted living. So I, I think this project has had a lot of good community input and hope that you will support it tonight. We're here to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Ken. All right, let's go to members of the community. Okay, I have Ali Sapperman. Okay, so I'm calling in-person speakers. So when I call your name, please make your way to the center aisle if you if you're the first one to the microphone just come up to the microphone state your name and begin your comments um ali sapperman umberto neva brian wheatley and alex dirsch if the four of you can make your way towards the microphone thank you go ahead Good evening, my name is Ali Saperman and I'm here on behalf of the Housing Action Coalition to speak in strong support of the Cambrian Village Project. HAC was proud to endorse this project and coordinate over 50 letters to each council office from residents as well as housing advocates, such as Yumbi Action, SVLG, Greenbelt Alliance, the Bay Area Council, and Catalyze SV. The message is clear, Cambrian Village has excellent land use, transforming a largely vacant shopping center and sea of parking to 428 new homes to help ease the housing crisis. I also want to highlight something that the mayor said a few meetings ago during the El Paseo hearing in which he said that the projects have an expectation from our general plan in which if they follow the guidelines that their project should be approved and if there's concerns with the project at this point then our general plan should be amended not the project and Kimco specifically made tremendous efforts to meet with neighbors and the council the project has been delayed for over six years now and how, as a housing insecure resident, I'm eager to see the incredible impact Cambrian Village Project will have on our community. Please move this project forward without delay in a way that can be feasibly built. Thank you. Next speaker. Um, good evening, um, Council Mayor. Uh, my name, um, 
Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, my name is Humberto Nava, a few representative of the Carpenters Local 405 here in San Jose. The Cambrian Village development before you this evening has the potential to put a lot of folks to work over the course of its build out. Having local representation in this project will provide opportunity for women, minorities at risk, youth, to, uh, to have a path into the construction industry. We, we're currently engaged in conversations with Kimco Realty on this development and are looking forward to a partnership that brings this project to life. That said, projects like Cameron Village have the ability to change the lives for those right here in this community. Apprentices, apprenticeships are proven vehicles in the middle class. These days, some might ask what that is. They provide the training necessary to the successful in the industry, in the construction industry, and with the success comes stability. Healthcare and retirement are two factors that also bring stability. As you consider this development and others that come before you to this body, we ask that new standards are in place that generate opportunity for, for those who wish to enter the construction industry and residents here in San Jose. Thank you. I'm personally willing to sit down with each one of you and see what happens and see this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, Mayor Licardo, Mayor Licardo, my own council member Foley, and the rest of the council. Good to see at least some of you in person. It's been quite a while. As many of you know, education is my area of expertise, so I thought I'd start with a quote. We see so many people outside every day on our streets. This is because we live in a place that is out of reach for so many. It's simple math. If you're not paying less for rent or making more money, the eco economic pressures in Silicon Valley will crush you without mercy. And that's Ray Bramson. I hope you've had the opportunity to read my op-ed in the San Jose Spotlight. Cambrian Village will bring incredible community benefits to District 9 that residents deserve and have been waiting for years to get. Oh, by the way, my other jam is unions, and I hope this wonderful project will employ unionized labor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, come forward. I also have Ann Wilkes and Jordan Grimes. Please make your way to the center. Go ahead, speaker. Hello, and good evening, council members. My name is Alex Dirsch, and I am a resident in the Willow Glen neighborhood here in San Jose, just four miles from this project site. As a young professional who graduated college only a couple years ago, I struggle to earn enough to afford living on my own. I'm fortunate enough to be able to live with my family, but I'm concerned for so many others in my position who either want to or need to move out and can't find affordable housing nearby. Two things have become increasingly clear to me. One, we have a housing shortage that is the primary contributor to our unaffordable and inaccessible housing market. Two, we have no hope of lowering the cost of housing unless we build more of it, both affordable and market rate. That's why I'm excited to speak to you this evening in support of the Cambrian Park Mixed Use Village Project. This is an excellent opportunity to turn an underutilized space mostly for cars into a bustling and vibrant space for people. It's so awesome to see mixed use nature of this project and I'm confident people will love living here and I know many neighbors like myself will enjoy it too. I urge you to vote to move the project forward. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Thank you. The Cambrian project with its senior living, independent units, as well as assisted living, gives me hope that I will be able to continue to live in San Jose when I no longer wish or am able to live in my two-story home. This living situation would allow for multiple options within walking distance, no hills to climb, keep my current doctors and dentists, not lose my social contacts, and still be an active citizen in San Jose where I have lived for more than 30 years. I only hope that VTA would improve the bus services on line 61 and 37, one going to Berryessa Bart and the other to light rail on Winchester. By the time this facility is all built, I'll be in my seventh decade and probably more than ready to move. Please. This is a great project. Thank you, next speaker. Yes, good evening, staff, council, and honorable mayor. 
My name is Jordan Grimes. I am the South Bay Resiliency Manager uh, for Greenbelt Alliance. Uh, we are an environmental nonprofit dedicated to helping build uh, sustainable climate resilient communities. We are strongly in support of the Cambrian Village project, and I'm here tonight to share that support. We believe the proposal presents a significant opportunity for the city, resulting in the transformation of a sea of surface parking and a decaying strip mall into 428 brand new multifamily homes. With more than four acres of publicly accessible open space, hundreds of new bicycle parking spaces, new raised bike lanes, community serving retail space for small business and much needed housing, Cambrian Village has the potential to become a vibrant mixed use center that will benefit the entire community of San Jose. The millions of dollars in in lieu fees provided will go a long way to funding badly needed, deeply affordable, very low income and extremely low income housing units elsewhere in other parts of the city. Thank you. Thank you. We're moving on to the Zoom speakers. I have Paul. Paul, go ahead, press star six to unmute. Okay, I'm gonna move on to Nadine. Good evening. I just wanted to um, express my concerns about going forward with the annexation of this property at this point. Uh, the EIR did not take into account the buildup of the North 40 in Los Gatos. Uh, that analysis not, was not put into the EIR and it will most definitely affect the traffic pattern here. I don't understand how we can just ignore that. Um, another concern I have is that city and uh, county border this property at the back and on Union Avenue. And so far, I haven't seen a lot of um, cooperation uh, and talking about the issues that will occur because it borders both. Uh, so that still concern concerns me also as a citizen. Thank you. Jonathan. Uh, hi, um, I live a couple blocks away from the plaza. I've lived here for almost 10 years. I'm very excited to see this development in the neighborhood. Um, I've been following the development really closely ever since the alternative designs that were just under their strip mall and an ocean of concrete. So I'm very happy with the design that we're talking about tonight. I am really excited to be able to walk over and use all the public spaces and the shopping and the, and the restaurants. Um, I've been uh, a participant in some of the community info sessions <clears throat> from the Friends of Cayman Park Plaza. And I've seen all the passion that's gone into you know, people's uh, attempts to make sure that the final plan addresses the community concerns. But it sometimes feels like some people think that if this is not approved, then it will just stay frozen in time and maybe the bowling alley will come back. And that just doesn't seem realistic. So I really hope you'll support this proposal and have you move forward. Tara? Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Tara Rangito on behalf of Silicon Valley Residents for Responsible Development, which is an association of individuals and labor organizations formed to advocate for responsible development, including housing projects, which mitigate impacts and provide a positive benefit to the community. We filed comments today in response to the staff report. The City Council cannot certify the EIR or approve the project this evening because the EIR fails to comply with CEQA. First, the project's noise impacts are underestimated. Our expert determined that the construction noise levels across nearly the entire project site would be significant and unmitigated. In particular, residents at Burke Hall Lane will be significantly impacted by construction noise during the first year of construction. Second, the EIR fails to disclose significant public health impacts from the exposure of local residents to diesel particulate matter emissions during project construction. We urge the City Council to remand the project to staff to revise and recirculate the EIR. Thank you. Frank? Yeah, hi, thanks. Thanks for the time allowing me. And I just want to say I'm a uh, Cambrian uh, resident. I've been living in the, uh, the valley for over 60 years, and this is probably one of the most exciting projects that I, I could uh, foresee. So please uh, proceed with this and, and let's delay no, no further. Thank you. Catherine? Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm Catherine Hedges, a downtown resident and member of Catalyze SV. Um, 
I have not examined the CEQA for this, but I hope that people are not trying to misuse the CEQA process to block an otherwise uh, very good project. I've seen a lot of changes and improvements to this project over the course of the review process. And you know, as somebody who spent several years down the block from the development of Miro Towers downtown, I fail to see how this project could cause any more noise or particulates than that project did. And I have to wonder if it's just a pretext for please don't consider. Anil? <clears throat> Hello, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. As a resident of San Jose, I'm excited about this project. As a believer in the potential of San Jose, this project will benefit not only the community it resides in, but the greater city by providing over 400 units of housing, retail space to provide a local place for shoppers, for residents rather, open space and critically needed senior housing. San Jose continues to be a magnet for investment and this project is a strong example of that. I wanna thank those involved to get this project where it is now and encourage the council to get it across the finish line by supporting this step in the process and to see everyone's effort come to fruition. Thank you. Rebecca. Good evening, council. Thank you very much for um, uh, this project. I enthusiastically support it. Um, it will be a great improvement to our community. It's time we need to go out with the old and in with the new and bring this wonderful project to our community. Thank you. Joan Tran. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. I uh, majored in environmental studies from UC Santa Cruz. I work as a nurse at Good Sam Hospital and I've lived in Cambria since 2011. I'm strongly supportive of this project. And for those who are opposing it because of traffic uh, or uh, particulates in the air, I would say that, hey, this there's going to be um, building of things uh, everywhere anyway. We're going to have population growth. Let's go ahead and move forward. I think the designers and the planners have taken in account many different voices from many different uh, groups. And I think this is the best plan we have yet so far. Let's, so let's go ahead and vote to move forward. Thank you. Christine. Christine. Okay, I'm going to move on to Ryan. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor uh, Licardo, Vice Mayor Jones, and City Council. Uh, my name is Ryan Globus. I'm a San Jose resident, and I live in District 6, and I'm calling to urge you to support this project. Um, I just wanted to add, you know, my neighborhood is very similar to what these plans look like. My neighborhood has, you know, homes for seniors, brand new affordable apartments, market rate apartments, townhomes, single family homes. We have a small park. We have some dining and shops nearby that we can walk to. And I love my neighborhood and I want more people to be able to enjoy similar neighborhoods. Um, so please support this and let's get this moving because every year that projects like this are delayed, the housing crisis gets worse. Uh, so please support this. Thank you. Kristen. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Kristen Brown, and I'm the Director of Government Relations for the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, representing over 350 member companies in the innovation economy here in Silicon Valley. I'm pleased to share that we endorse the Cambrian Village project before you this evening because it's a well-balanced proposal that meets the needs of the community and the city's urban village general plan goals. This project will provide much needed housing opportunities from rental to home ownership to assisted living. It will also contribute to the city's tax base with a new hotel and commercial space. Current residents will benefit from the four acres of open space with community activation and commercial spaces for small businesses. We encourage moving forward with this project as detailed in the staff recommendation for this item. And I thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Take care. Great. Greg Bunker. Good evening. I would like to say that I've uh, 
been a resident uh, and uh, commercial property owner here at uh, 1900 Camden Avenue since 1975. And I think the project is absolutely amazing. It'll increase the property values of all the residents in the area, increase all the property values of all the commercial property owners in the area. It's uh, fantastically designed. It, it probably will go down as the single most important thing uh, ever built in Cambrian Park. And I strongly recommend uh, its approval. And thank you for your time this evening. Alexander. Hello, my name is Alex Melendrez. I am the organizing manager for South Bay Yimby and Yimby Action. Uh, I really just want to reiterate some of the other comments that you've heard earlier tonight, particularly from Ali Saperman, Alex Dersh, uh, Jordan Grimes of Greenbelt Alliance. I'm not sure what more can be said about this particular project, given its uh, green benefits, um, potential for economic development in the area, and probably what's most important to us at EMB Action is the need for abundant and affordable housing. People usually come through our org uh, in three different manners. It's through economic concerns, it's through environmental concerns, and the obvious crush of the housing shortage and housing crisis. This particular project hits all three. And it's all to provide uh, roofs over heads for actual human beings. So we can't delay this project any further. Please approve it and please move it forward. Thank you. Gabriel? Hello. Um, uh, as a longtime resident of San Jose and advocate for affordable, affordable housing and sustainable design, I would like to voice support for this project. This project, uh, this, this design, the design of this project is exactly what residents want. Um, design that is inclusive of community input and that creates a sense of community and that provides much needed affordable housing units and funds to the city. It is not the 10 story development in the middle of single family homes. It is a truly urban village. Gradual progression from low rise to mid rise to high rise with parks and with parks to accommodate the new and the existing community. Please do what you can to make this hot fit, uh, project happen fast as we needed this yesterday. And I hope that the council will address and at least try to get a soft commitment of sorts that developer will um, attend to some of the environmental concerns that have been pointed out during this comment session and the um, uh, um, the benefits for existing businesses that will have to transit. Lalo. Hi, good evening, council members. My name is Lalo Mendez and I'm the project development specialist for Catalyze SB. I'm here this evening on behalf of our project advocacy members who provided feedback and scored this project in February of 2021. Two things which our members really liked are the community engagement. This is a developer who's been engaged through meetings, surveys, and direct outreach with the community, as well as the vibrancy. This is a project which contributes to the positive benefits of the site as well as the surrounding community. Yet our members think this project can be better, especially with affordable housing. We were happy to see that the affordable unit count went from 15 to 30 units, yet the AMI at 100%, which is now $117,000, is very, very high. So our members want to see, want to see one Thing. We want to see, we want to increase the number of affordable homes to 50, as echoed by some council members in a recent memo, and or even lower the AMI to 60%. Um, so those are my recommendation, and I strongly urge you to, to support this project today. Thank you. Alex Shore. Well, kudos to the development team and council member Foley for sticking with this project for many years, bringing it this far and getting a really great project. Uh, particularly excited about the increase of affordable housing over time to go, as Lalo said, from 15 to 30 and potentially tonight to 50 affordable homes. That would be a huge benefit for our community. And we appreciate the developer making so many improvements for so long through this project. I think what you've seen is a lot of folks in our community were concerned about this project and you're seeing so much support here tonight because the city and the developer have been responsive to community needs, creating a project that will be a vibrant place for a lot of people to live, play and enjoy. So, so grateful for your approving the project. And if the developer can make these improvements in the council member, we, we would. Carl.
Hi, uh, my name is Carl Norum. I live just down the road from where this development is going to be. And I've got to say, I'm super happy with how the plans have turned out and evolved over time. Um, I want to echo everybody's statements about how we would like this to have been built already. Um, so I'm really hoping that council will approve things and get this project moving. Thank you. Jeffrey. Good evening, Mayor and members of the Council. My name is Jeffrey Herdman, and I'm a San Jose resident here to urge you to move this project forward. The plan offers a number of community benefits that, despite its best efforts, the uh, existing marking mall and parking lot do not offer, such as a public park, a plaza full of small shops and restaurants, and amenities like dog parks, playgrounds, and an exercise area. Uh, but one aspect that really stood out to me was the mixed housing options from apartments to townhomes, a senior living facility, and single family homes all included in this project. As someone who grew up in an exclusively single family zone neighborhood that hoarded property wealth, quality public schools and community amenities, you know, the hands of its wealthy residents, it's nice to see a project that, you know, will share these resources among different groups and different income levels to create a truly integrated community. So please don't delay this project any further and move it across the finish line. Thank you. Annie. Hi, um, my name is Annie and I grew up in San Jose and I currently live about two minutes away from Cambrian Park Plaza and I just want to express my support for moving forward with this development because I'm really excited for all of the different components of this. I know all of my neighbors are and every day I drive past there and there hasn't been any progress. It's really disappointing. So I do hope that uh, the council moves forward uh, with this project. Thank you. Christine. Hi, good evening. This is Christine Kuvaris on behalf of the Friends of Cambrian Park Plaza. There is no doubt that Cambrian Park Plaza needs to be redeveloped and it will certainly be beautiful when it is. However, a significant development is occurring close by in Los Gatos, the North 40 project. This project, among others, was ignored in the EIR's traffic analysis for Cambrian Park Plaza. Why? Because the city of Los Gatos failed to provide input when asked once back in 2020, and there was never any follow-up. Over 500 Cambrian residents have signed our letter from the Friends of Cambrian Park to ask the city to postpone approval of the EIR until the traffic analysis is fully completed and appropriate mitigations are in place. The Cambrian neighborhood deserves a full and complete EIR. Everybody is so focused on the additional housing units the project will bring, yet the traffic impacts of this development are being entirely ignored. The reality is people will be driving to and from the plaza to visit and live. There are speakers here today from many groups. Raj? Roth, R A G H. Okay, I'm going to move on to Jake. Hi, uh, my name is Jake Wild. I'm a 22 year long Cambrian resident. I've lived here my whole life. I'm going to school here in San Jose. And I hope to be able to continue to live here after I finish my schooling, uh, once my family moves away. Uh, and I think projects like this one will allow me to do so. Thank you. I hope it moves forward. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, yeah, Paul Soto from Horseshoe. Um, I could see this is probably one of the largest annexations that's happened since the 1939 map was created. You have to understand, eight months before that 1939 map was created, Willow Glen was annexed into the city of San Jose. That's why the red line map was created. Okay, and so I could see that my, my words are wasted here. Put this in front of a judge. So I guarantee you, if you go ahead and pass this, and there's going to be a lawsuit that's going to be filed. Because I'm tired of dealing with this council, and we need to put this in front of a judge and let the judge decide. Just like he's going to decide on August 22nd with regard to me, which I'm going to win that case. Okay, and then you'll see what I can do inside of a courtroom with an objective judge, because that's what's going to have to happen here. Because this is a large land grab, probably since that 1939 map. And Vivian. Vivian? 
Okay, moving on to Eugene. Good evening, council members. Eugene Bradley, Silicon Valley Transit Users. I echo Mr. Shore's comments. It should be noted that at Cambrian, that, that proposed development, it's on two VTA bus lines, the 27 going along Blossom Hill Road and the 61, a lot of which is due to have more frequent service increases in October. Also with the Blossom Hill proposal, that's right on, that's right at the Blossom Hill Light Rail Station. That's supposed to have its frequencies increased back to 15 minutes all day in October. So real concerns about traffic. Any traffic should have also mentioned that the fact that there's already BTA bus and light rail service that's going to these developments right now to help relieve the traffic, some of which whose service will be increased pretty soon. So let's move forward with these projects, make it happen. Thank you. Moria. Yes, thank you very much. My name is Moria Lee Errett and I live in Cambrian Park. Um, I do not believe this project should go forward as is. I don't think enough attention has been focused on the impact of traffic and pollution and um, the number of people they want to put in there. Uh, the, someone used the word fantastic. I think it is fantastic in the sense that it's not realistic as is. And um, a park is, means nothing when you're going to plant so many people on it. There's, there, there won't, if you want space, let there be space and build fewer houses around it, or just cut back on the number of people that you're going to put there and the number of cars. And um, that's all. Thank you for letting me share. Mike? Mike, here, go ahead. Ellie, you are a nigger. Back to council. All right, thank you. Um, we'll go back to council now for discussion. Uh, I just wanted to uh, announce for the many residents who are here to speak, I think on open oh, forum uh, about <clears throat> Uh, the issue about housing on the Noble uh, Avenue site. Um, the, the, the city council cannot make any decision at all legally about that at today's hearing. Uh, in order to be able to make any decisions, we have to, under state law, provide notice to you and the rest of the community about whatever we're going to do. That hasn't been done, so, so there's no decision we can possibly make. I understand many of you would like to be heard, and you're certainly welcome to be heard, at the conclusion of today's calendar, but we have another item to consider after we discuss this one. I want everyone to be aware of that. We have, uh, staff will be recommending tomorrow, uh, if not tomorrow, then very soon to the Rules Committee, that a date be set for a public hearing of this issue so that you can participate, so the council can make a decision, and that will be no later than October 25th, but it may well be October 25th because staff, as you probably know, working very hard to try to find alternative sites and also to finally determine the viability of the Noble Avenue site. And so if there's going to be an earlier date, then I know Councilmember Cohen and I and staff will be very active in notifying the community if there is a date that is sooner, if you want to participate then. But I can tell you October 25th is going to be the date if they can't figure it out sooner. And so at least everyone's got a date and they know there's going to be an opportunity to be heard and there will be a council discussion and deliberation at that time. I know kids need to go to bed, and so folks may not be able to stay, and I just wanted everyone at least to have the benefit of that information so you can, you can decide how, how you want to spend your evening uh, because we're going to be spending it here. <laughs> okay, let's go to council uh, discussion on this item. Uh, council Member Foley. Thank you. Do you mind if I take my mask off? I've got a lot to Please. say in connection yes. with this. Thank you. Uh, first, I, I want to start off by thanking the co-signers on the memo that we submitted today or on Friday. The mayor, vice mayor, and council member Perales and council member Cohen. I'd also like to thank all of the community members who came out and spoke in favor of the project. And, and truthfully, those who have expressed concerns as well because we've listened to all of them. 
We've been engaged in this project for five years. I've been on council for almost four years and I've been engaged actively since then and the majority of my staff have been too. I'd also like to thank the Friends of Cambrian Park Plaza and the Cambrian Community Council whose input really did help the project be reformulated to be the family friendly gateway project that you see today. The original project was not as exciting, not as dynamic, not as family focused or as uh, pedestrian safe, uh, which is what we were trying to accomplish. We asked the developer to go back to the drawing board and they came back to the drawing board with the proposal that you see before you today. I want to thank the developer, Kimco. Originally, it was Weingarten who purchased the property. We worked, worked with Tim Frakes, who is also here too. Thank you, Tim, for being here. And Kimco then acquired Weingarten, and so now Kimco took it over, and you already heard from Michael Strauss. I want to thank Kimco, the architect, and the consultant in helping us get it to where this project is today. I want to thank additionally the hardworking staff at our city, including, and, and I'm not going to name them off because I know there have been so many people, so many staff members who've had their hands involved in this that I'm sure to leave someone out. So I'm merely going to say, well, Laura's right here and Laura's been holding our hands through the whole process for really three years, I think, at least. I want to thank the staff in PBCE, DOT, Public Works, and the City Manager's Office for their work on the project. There's a lot of thank yous to, to give before I get into why this is so important and so relevant to be built today in the Cambrian area. And finally, I want to give a special thank you to my staff, to Kyle, Scott, Shirley, Claire, and Jack for their professionalism and persistence in reaching out to the community, arranging meetings, and responding to the community about the project and to Michael Lomio in the mayor's office, who was, not, who was instrumental in moving the, this forward while at my office and later moved over to the mayor's office where he was instrumental as well. As I said earlier, this project is almost five years in the making and throughout those five years, the developer and the community have worked together with us extensively to create a strong project with numerous public benefits. As I said, the original proposal had some issues. We asked them to come back with family friendly, pedestrian safe, do something with the parking. We do not want this to be car centric. We want it to be bike centric, stroller centric, pedestrian centric. And they came back putting all of the parking or the majority of the parking underground, which is an expensive adventure for them, but was necessary for us because it makes the street now and the parks and the open space easily accessible and safe for our children and pedestrians to walk around. The most important part of the Cambrian village is how much and how diverse the housing will be that is being proposed. The, the most important pro part of the project to me is the senior housing. It starts with assisted living, then there's assist, I'm sorry, it starts with independent living, then moves to assisted living, then moves to memory care. There's, that's fabulous for our seniors and thank you for the woman who said she'll be in her 70s when this project is developed. This is a perfect location for you to put, to have your family members age in place in a really lovely place. Additionally, there's market rate housing. Market rate housing towards the back of the project that also have ADUs. That's the market rate single family homes. That's a small part of the actual development. Then there's the apartment building that is on the corner. On the corner, that's a six story, office, a six -story mixed use building that initially uh, there was no affordable housing proposal. I pushed the developer to add some in. They came back with 15 units. I pushed back a little bit more they said, okay, 30. Then in our memo we submit, that we submitted today and we'll all submit on the record and we will vote on, we are requesting 50 and the developer has agreed to the 50, 50 affordable housing units. And yes, that is at 100% AMI. And I wanna thank them for sharpening their pencils and coming up with the ability 
to go from 30 units to 50 units. That really is something because we do have an affordable housing issue. And what I would like to say to those who are concerned about the 100% AMI is that in District 9, we have nearly 1,000 units of home of affordable housing units that are being proposed in other parts of District 9 that will have lower AMI. AMI is average median income for those who aren't familiar with the acronym. That's a base income of the people who can live in those homes. And that is being is lowered throughout much of the district in about 1,000 units that we will see coming online very in various stages. One right now on Bascom uh, that's, that's ready to be um, ready to go to fruition. One moment, can't read my notes anymore. I, eyes are getting old and it's getting late. Additionally, uh, there's, there's not just housing, there's also retail and jobs that are a tremendous asset for the community. This is the gateway for Cambrian. Cambrian doesn't really have a law, landmark. When people think of where's Cambrian, I always have to def, uh, describe it in relation to other places. It's south of this, it's east of, east of that, it's north of that. This will define where Cambrian is. It will, instead of people who live in Cambrian in that area feeling the need to go to the prune yard for dinner or uh, an opportunity to wander around retail or to go to Los Gatos or to go to Lincoln Avenue, they can stay in District 9, walk to District 9, hang out, have a cup of coffee, watch their kids play. It's just going to be delightful and uh, a wonderful family opportunity for us. Of course, there are going to be concerns about traffic. There has to be, but there are mitigation efforts that will be in place with traffic, uh, particularly uh, an effort to prevent traffic from going into some of the neighboring streets. I'm very happy that the developer has agreed to all of the points in our memo, which I will be reading in a few minutes. The developers agreed to continue to work with the community and the District staff, Nine's office to keep us informed of the progress of this project as it goes forward. I hope the developer can continue to work with the local school districts as the, as the housing will likely bring in children and will likely impact those schools and those schools uh, will benefit, but they may need some assistance too. So I'm hoping that the developer will sit down with school districts and see how they can work together. The project's going to provide affordable housing, as I mentioned, and I already mentioned that we've provide, we have on nearly 1,000 units coming in District 9 in various stages of development. And if you're really interested and you live in District 9, I'm gonna have a town hall just on affordable housing and what that's all about, so watch my newsletter. If you haven't signed up for it, sign up for it, and you can find out all about that. This is a signature project which means that it has certain requirements for housing, certain requirements for jobs, and this signature project meets those standards. The time to delay is over. We have worked on this project for five years and it checks all the box. As city staff reported, the planning commission voted unanimously in support of this project. And while the developer can't please everyone, the project before you today is exceptional. Is it the best project we could have in Cambrian? I, th I say yes. There's a lot of outdoor space, a lot of opportunities. It's just gonna be fabulous. I, I, I know I'm overselling it, but I just feel that I need to, and I've, this has been a long time in coming for me and my staff. A Couple of point, things I wanna point out in the memo that uh, my Brown Act partners all signed, thankfully is one requesting additional traffic and pedestrian improvements at the request of neighboring residents, particularly Taper. And I wanna thank the DOT staff for engaging the Taper community and that the residents in that area to listen to their concerns and come up with a plan to divert traffic away from Taper so that it doesn't flow into the neighborhood. Additionally, there is a requirement of the owners of the village to coordinate the final design of the Central Park with the community and to communicate regularly in quarterly basis with the community and include the District 9 office so 
we can all be informed and have good communication back and forth. To get to this point, we had many, many community meetings, large meetings, small meetings, individual meetings, and that was just us. I know the developer had their own meetings too. Additionally, there are a lot of small businesses uh, at the Cambrian Park Plaza right now, and everybody has their favorite, and we don't wanna lose any of them. So we have included in the memo a provision to address those tenants who are longtime residents uh, of the Cambrian Park. They're small business, small independent business owners. So I hope it can be worked out that they can stay or come back at least. And if not, that they find a good home where their businesses continue can continue to thrive. And I'm just gonna put a shout out for Heartbeat Cafe because it's the, my favorite place over there. Um, I've talked about the 50 deed restricted affordable housing units, and those are just some of the highlights. Because this is annexation, I know uh, our staff explained the process. This is gonna be a three step process that comes to city council. This is the first one. Today we are being asked to certify the EIR to pre-zone the site and initiate the annexation proceedings. We can expect to see this before us again with the annexation authorization in September, and then the final PD approval, hopefully a month or two after that. It's my hope that the approval of the motion today will signal that the council, city council approves of the Cambrian Village as the project stands, to, 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 so, uh, stands today. With that, I request council support to bring this beautiful project to fruition. It is the gateway to Cambrian. It has a beautiful town square. It's a development we can all be proud of. It is family and community oriented. It's a place we can live, work, and play. With that, I move my memo and the staff recommendation and the supplemental staff report as well. Second. All right, Thank motion. you. I have two questions, if I could. Oh, sure. Thank you. Specifically regarding the EIR, questions have come up regarding uh, lack of response or consideration for the North 40. Can you tell us why that is or is not, uh, was why it was not included in the EIR, EIR and how does that affect the legitimacy of the EIR? Yes, good evening, Council Member Foley. I'm David Kahn, Principal Planner, Cities Environment Review Team. So I also have public works staff available to respond more, but essentially the document that the public is asking about is in the local transportation analysis, where there is the study of traffic congestion that is not a CEQA issue anymore with um, per state law and per the city's transportation impact policy. That's council policy 5-1. So this has been responded to in response to the EIR and response in subsequent comments. Um, the, the City Council Policy 5-1, CEQA impacts are based on vehicle miles traveled, which is the amount of distance that cars travel or people travel to get to destinations. It's not based on congestion. Um, however, we do have as part of that policy the for information purposes, the local transportation analysis. And I can have public work staff there on the call, um, they're on Zoom, they could also respond in more detail. Lily Bonjeet. Or he's, he's right here, okay. not on oh, Zoom. In person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in person, in the flesh. Hi, Jay Guevara, Deputy Director of Public Works. Thank you for the question, Council Member. As David Keon was uh, providing information on council policy 5-1, the city's metric is using the vehicle miles traveled. I wanna clarify that staff reached out as early as May of 2020 to local jurisdictions, including the town of Los Gatos. So having received no response from that neighboring jurisdiction, the non sequa portion, or what we like to call the local transportation analysis, the LTA, of the report is where we would look at that vehicle congestion. Since we didn't receive anything, we, we have to assume they have no comment. We are not staffed to constantly ask other neighboring jurisdictions to be sure that they respond. And we have to proceed, as you noted, 
Uh, more than once, this is already a five-year process. We need to provide speed and predictability for the development community and the community in general. So I hope that answers your question on that topic. It did. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And, and just finally, regarding the Planning Commission, they didn't consider that uh, take, they weren't concerned about that as well. They certified the EIR at the Planning Commission without that. It's considered a non sequel item. non sequel Okay, great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. The last item I have is really just a statement uh, regarding VTA. There are bus lines there. They don't run very often. They're not very consistent. And when the project is developed, there will be a tremendous amount of residents living there. So our hope, and if VTA is still on the line listening for other reasons, I hope that they will again provide the bus and transportation that we need when those pro when the the families are there who can who can utilize the bus and transportation system. So with that, um, I'm just so excited to be able to finally bring this through. At least step one, there are two more steps, and I hope that my council will support me in this and vote unanimously. With that, I'm conclu I conclude my remarks. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember, and thank you for all your work and leadership in this project. Um, all right. Let's go to any other comments from our colleagues. Uh, Council Member Sparza. Thank you. Uh, I just want to start by saying uh, I, I, I grew up in the San Jose. Um, I am very enthusiastic about seeing this area developed, particularly the way it's planned out. Um, I will be supporting the motion. Um, and I'd like to really acknowledge Council Member Foley's leadership on this issue. We started on the council at the same time. Um, and so I've been able to see how this uh, project has morphed with her leadership. Um, I wanted to tease out one point, um, and that is uh, the issues and questions that arose around uh, affordable housing. And um, so I wanted to amplify Council Member Foley's uh, comments earlier about having uh, a thousand units developed uh, within District 9 that are in the pipeline um, at a lower AMI. And that's really important. Um, we've had a lot of discussions on the council and in committees about equity um, and having a, a mix, a city of a mix of income so that uh, poverty and generational poverty doesn't continue in, in just one part of the city. And so um, I'm very happy to support this motion because I think it's a good project and because of Councilmember Foley's thoughtfulness um, about looking at the bigger picture. Um, and for those that um, have reached out to, to me and asked um, about affordable housing. Extremely low income is 30% of an area median income, and that's 54,600 uh, income for a family of four. 100% of the area median income is 168,500 for a family of four. So it's quite the difference, and I'd like to applaud Councilmember Foley for really being thoughtful um, so that this parcel can be developed the way it should be, um, and uh, including some equity in her district moving forward. So I will be enthusiastically voting yes. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. All right, Council Member Perales. Yeah, thank you. I'll be brief as well. I just wanted to, to echo appreciation for the leadership of Council Member Foley having these types of major developments, um, opportunities like this of a signature project, the ability to develop affordable housing, uh, mixed use projects all over the city uh, is, is truly what we need and what we're going to need if uh, we're going to end this, uh, this housing crisis. And, um, and so I just applaud her, her leadership and uh, as I co-signed onto the memo, I wholeheartedly support this effort. Thanks. Thank you. Council Member uh, Arenas? Oh, sorry. Oh, I think we'll go to you in just a moment. I think Council Member Arenas had her hand up. 
Uh, yes, I just wanted to also take a, an opportunity to thank uh, Council Member Foley for the work that she's done and um, the kind of change that's going to create that she's that her uh, team and her work ha are going to create for the Cambrian area. Not every area has kind of a town center, uh, a unifying area um, that brings everyone together. And I think this is what uh, she was referring to earlier in her comments. This is going to unify and 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 be a marker for the Cambrian area. And I'm really excited and a little jealous. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, uh, this is the kind of uh, opportunity that I think all of us uh, look forward to that has a mixed use, um, affordable market rate, and a continuum of living. And that is for a lot of our folks who are going to retire and are leaving our state and leaving our city. This is a continuum of living. And we want our generations to mix and to cohabitate together and to have fun and um, share open space. And so I'm, I'm really excited and I hope that uh, these kinds of developments can happen throughout all of our cities so that we can have um, really truly signature projects uh, throughout all of San Jose. And so I'll be voting, I'm supporting, uh, thank you. Thank you, Council Member uh, uh, Esparza. Thanks, Mayor. I just wanted to add on. So Council Member Foley mentioned Heartbeat Cafe, gave the plug for Heartbeat Cafe. I'm going to make the plug for Williams Cutlery. I think they're still in her district, but let's bring them back. Um, uh, over a hundred year old business. So for all you cooks out there. Um, anyway, that's it. Thanks. I'm just impressed they figured out a way to keep the, the sign. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it will take a little restoration, but I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, it's a nice uh, touch of uh, San Jose history. Uh, good to keep it going. All right, any other comments? All right, let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Absolutely, yes. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, item 10.5, uh, excuse me, 10.5 is administrative hearing on the environmental appeal, the planning director's adoption, the initial study and mitigated negative declaration for the Alvisa Hotel project. So we will have a presentation on this item. I've just been informed, I believe one of the appellants has dropped their appeal. Is that right, Chris? That's correct, Mayor. Um, David will lead us off in the presentation um, and we'll pursue it. Hey. Good evening, Mayor and members of the planning, the City Council. I'm David Kahn, Principal Planner on the City's Environmental Review Team. Before you tonight is an administrative hearing on the environmental appeal of the Planning Director's adaptation, ad, adoption of an initial study in mitigating negative declaration for the Alvisa Hotel project. Brief overview of the project. Um, this is an aerial view of the site. Uh, this is showing the top golf, and this is so the project site is just south of the top golf. So it is an area that is a part of the top golf plan development zoning, but was not evaluated in the top golf uh, initial study mitigated de de native declaration in 2016. Um, to the north is North First Street, and you also see at a more to the north. East is an area part of the Cisco Systems development and that overall approved development there. Uh, this is existing conditions on the site. Um, this is, um, the site is undeveloped. Uh, a part of it does have a slough that has, but it is an area that is not proposed for development. It is also just adjacent to the Guadalupe River. And again, as I said before, the top call site. project footprint. Um, so the project is the area in the red and above. This is the, so this is what it is. It is a hotel. It is a 214 room, five story hotel, a four story parking garage. Um, and also it is a 26 foot wide access road that goes along the northern part of the top golf site. The environmental 
clearance was an initial study mitigating the negative declaration um, that identified significant impacts to biological resources, cultural resources, and hazards. All of these all these impacts were identified to have a less than significant impact with mitigation measures. The document was circulated for public review. Again, the project. Project, the initial study mitigated the negative declaration was circulated for public review from October 12th um, to November 10th, 2021. The city received several comment letters and responded to those comments on March 24th, 2022, prior to the scheduled director's hearing. However, immediately prior to the scheduled director's hearing on April 6th, there were several more additional comment letters submitted. Um, these comment letters had to be addressed, so the city deferred the hearing to April 20th to adequately respond. All these responses are as part of, included as part of the packet to the city council and are posted on the city's website. At April 20, um, the, the, the um, at the director's hearing, the hearing officer heard from testimony from members of the public and also you know, heard staff reports to the responding to these concerns and considering the totality of the record, determined that the project was the ISMND, Initial Study Mitigating Declaration, was performed in full compliance with CEQA and the project complied with the general plan and zoning code and recommended that the initial study mitigated declaration be adopted and the project be approved. Within the set time frame, staff received three timely appeals of the environmental determination, um, one from a group represented by the Santa Clara Valley Autobahn Society. In addition, there was an appeal from Luz Drury representing the Laborers International Union of North America, and finally by an individual, Mark Espinoza. Um, would like to mention that as of this evening, the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society has withdrawn their appeal. However, as everything is part of the public record, it is still addressed as part of the appeal. So the appeal, just briefly, some of the reasons why um, raised in the appeal letters. This is also again in the packet. Um, segmentation to seek review of the prior top golf initial study mischaracterization of the site's baseline, um, inadequate reconnaissance level surveys, inadequate analysis of impacts to biological resources, including special status species and habitat, um, failure to analyze and mitigate the project's impact on wildlife movement, um, impacts of direct and indirect biological impacts due to lighting and cumulative impacts to biological resources. David, can I ask you to pull your microphone down a little bit? I okay. just think it's not, there okay. you go. Um, and finally, also inconsistency with the city's general plan policies, especially those related to environmental resources and bird safe design. Um, staff would like to first respond that all of these responses have been responded to and with as part of the packet. Um, in terms of biological resources, the initial study identified mitigation measures that are consistent with city practice and best management practices for reducing impacts to less significant, including to special status species. Um, in addition, the site it, project is subject to the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Conservation Plan, including conditions for burrowing owls and other species. And this includes the payment of land cover fees. Um, the project is not a segmentation of the prior, with the prior Top Golf approval. And this is because at, during the time of the Top Golf initial study, that time there was no development proposed and that's part of the project site. It was considered to be a remainder parcel. Um, CEQA does not, CEQA actually prohibits the analysis of speculative development because nothing was determined to be on that site at that time, it was not included. Therefore, at this time the project is approved, it is now analyzed fully and includes the top golf as part of the background condition. In terms of baseline condition, I'd like to mention that the baseline, the the argument raised was that the baseline condition considered to be developed. Um, for the pur purposes of evaluating environmental impacts, the site was disturbed as part of prior development, especially as late, most recently as a staging area for the top golf site. Um, with this, staff is recommendation that the city council deny the environmental appeal 
and uphold the planning director's adaptation of the Alviza Hotel Project Initial Study Mitigated Negative Declaration and Associated Mitigation and Monitoring Program, and find that the City Council has read and considered the initial study. Um, the initial study and mitigated negative declaration was prepared in full compliance with CEQA. Adoption of the initial study mitigated neg negative declaration reflects the independent judgment and analysis of the city and preparation of a new environmental document is not required. Thank you and that concludes staff's presentation. All right, thank you, David. <clears throat> okay, so I believe we go to the appellant first, is that right? Uh, how many minutes does the appellant get? Five, okay. Uh, so here, who's here to speak for the appellant? I think we have two appellants left. One, one step back. Is that right? Um, do you know the name? I could see if you're online. I, I. Uh, well, Shawnee was one. Brian Flynn and Mark Espinoza. Okay, I have all three. Um, I have all three online. So that's Shawnee Klein, Klein House. House. Yes. Brian Flynn, I'm promoting them. Okay. So um, I'm happy to take uh, anyone in whichever order. So why don't we go first to see who, whoever gets promoted to the panel first can proceed. Yeah, they're both in. Oh, they're both in. Okay, great. Uh, Shawnee, uh, welcome. <laughs> Shani, are you able to hear me? I think she's muted right now. Oh, Shani, could you I, 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 Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Ricardo and council members. I'm Shani Kleinhaus. I'm the environmental advocate for Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. And I'm pleased to tell you tonight that we have reached an agreement with Terra and therefore we're withdrawing our appeal of the planning director approvals regarding the Elviso Hotel project. Thank you. Thank you, Shani. All right, next we'll go to Mr. Flynn. Good evening, Brian. can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Brian. Good evening, Mayor and Honorable City, City Council members. Uh, my name is Brian Flynn from the law firm Lozo Drury. I uh, hear on behalf of the Appellant Laborers International Union of North America, Local Union 270. Uh, as explained in more detail in our written materials, Lyon is requesting that the council grant the appeal tonight uh, because a full environmental impact report should be prepared rather than the negative declaration due to the project's impacts to biological resources and air quality. So under CEQA, the standard for preparing an EIR is whether there's a fair argument that the project might have significant impacts. Uh, we submitted comments from a biological expert, Dr. Smallwood, who found numerous shortcomings with the MND. Uh, he's now conducted two site visits and he's seen 62 different species of wildlife on the site. Only a fraction of those were identified or discussed in the uh, MND. Uh, and several of them are bird species of conservation concern, which gives them special status under CEQA. So the negative declaration underestimates the diversity of wildlife utilizing the site and also underestimates uh, accordingly the, the impacts to those species, uh, which should be remedied in an EIR. Uh, we also submitted uh, comments from an indoor air quality expert who raised serious concerns about increased cancer risk to future hotel employees from formaldehyde emissions. Uh, these emissions were in excess of the CEQA significance threshold of 10 and 1 million. Uh, importantly, and, and his reply to the city's response, these risk calculations assumed that materials would be compliant with the formaldehyde standards set by the Air Resources Board uh, and still found them to be significant. Uh, so that requires an EIR as well. Uh, and lastly, the MND's analysis of the project's greenhouse gas and energy impacts is lacking. Uh, for example, the city's greenhouse gas reduction strategy, quote, encourages the installation of solar panels or other clean energy power generation sources over parking areas, end quote. Here, there's no solar panels going in over the giant parking structure. They're only going in over the hotel. So the project is inconsistent with the city's reduction strategy and is also inconsistent with CEQA's requirement that the MND consider renewable energy alternatives uh, to build into the project. So for those reasons, uh, and the reasons discussed in our written comments, we request that an EIR be prepared prior to further consideration of this project and prior to any further approval of this project. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. And Mr. Espinoza, I believe, also needs to be promoted. 
He also has an appeal, is that right? I think we got him. Okay, Mr. Espinoza, are you able to hear me? Well, we have two es Mark Espinozas, so hopefully we promoted the right one. All right. Uh, Mr. Espinoza, if you're able to hear me, go ahead and unmute. Okay. Hello, I can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, we welcome your, your statement, sir. And I'd like to add, um, Marcos Espinoza is is awaiting to be heard as well. He's he's uh, joined with our group, and he wants to be able to speak. So if there's only five minutes for me, I can give him half of my time. Yeah, that'd be fine, it's however you want to divide it. Okay, that would be great. Um, yes, I oppose this project. Um, it's failure to adhere to the Alviso Master Plan, failure to report future uh, hotel development in the first development project and segment. This is a segmented project, causes inaccurate impacts. Um, with this, if this is approved, this will be the ninth hotel located within a half a mile of Alviso community. Why do we need nine hotels? within walking distance of our community. That's just overwhelming. These hotels are blocking our obstacles to our, our, our uh, wildlife, our birds that migrate through the Guadalupe River. These, this is just a very big obstacle. There's multiple of these um, buildings throughout uh, the Guadalupe corridor. Um, we also have police services an issue in Alviso. So we have nine hotels with very very little police service has has there's been has the police been informed of how many hotels are in the area and can they service the calls when these um hotels need service from our police department that has not happened i would request that uh, you guys deny uh the building of this project and have it um require a full eir so we can get more information and and see what can be done about all the impacts that are going to happen because if this is uh, goes forward and that's all I have to say uh, you can uh, allow Marcos Espinoza to take off the remainder of my time thank you uh, Marcos welcome good evening council members and mayor uh, my name is Marcos Espinoza I'm a member of the community of Malviso uh, I just want to first say I agree and support all the points made by the other appellants in their appeal letters so I want to uh, uh, mention the impact that this will have on Alviso, you know, the air quality, quality of life, and the effects on our natural life. Also, uh, if this is approved, there will be twice as many hotel rooms in Alviso than there are actually houses. And I want to mention what are these hotels catering to? I, it's not for the Alviso community. These are catering to events maybe that are associated with the Levi Stadium. So, you know, these would be more appropriate to be made by close to the Levi Stadium in Santa Clara. Uh, I, this project needs a full EIR. Uh, Topgolf was allowed to just use an MND and that it has proven to be insufficient already. Uh, the parking at Topgolf overcrowds mainly every day and People are parking in our community around our local parks. Most of these people are drinking alcohol beverages in the open, blasting loud music. And uh, I recently seen a video article from a major news outlet stating how many hotels are used to sex traffic individuals. I'm not saying this hotel will, but the increase in hotels may lead to more violent crimes and crimes against humans. I strongly urge the city to think about this and also to follow the Alviso master plan. This plan was made over 20 years ago and this is a guideline that the city should follow. I hope that every council member and the mayor has read this plan through from page to page because then they'll get a better understanding of how Alviso is supposed to be laid out and how the future is. This plan was made over 20 years ago and it in its plan it says in 30 years all resources should uh, look and have the same feel as a small town feel it shouldn't be nothing like san jose and i feel like the city of san jose has not uh, followed the plan 
and also, uh, you know, we got to study all the impacts. And there's another hotel that still has to be built. So, you know, when you do these studies, are they just calculating one hotel? Or are they doing the next hotel that's going to be built and the stores that are going to be built? You know, there's still a lot of things that need to be built there. And also the environment with the, the area where that's being built mainly could be dumped under there could have asbestos in the dirt. Is that being addressed in its studies of the MND? And uh, that, that'll be it for me. Okay, thank you, sir. <clears throat> All right, let's continue with public comment now, Tony. I have no speaker cards in person. So online, I have Michael, no. I think that's the same person from before. No, I don't believe so. Michael, okay. you. Okay, Michael. Uh, thank you. Hi, it's Michael Hugh. I'm part of the development team uh, that is building this project. I want to thank uh, the mayor and the council members for allowing me to have an opportunity to speak briefly. I just want to say that I've been involved with this project for five years and uh, have a strong affinity for this community. And I really want to thank city staff for doing really an outstanding job, an exhaustive and extensive review of all of the comments that have been made uh, and doing their due diligence, not only on the Top Golf project, but on this as well. And the strong relationship we've had with the Audubon Society in addressing all of their concerns. I think this is a great project for the community. Uh, I think that the extensive work that's been done has all been very highly professional. And again, I just applaud city staff and thank them for their fine work on this project. Thank you. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, I'd like to draw the council's attention to the fact that Alviso was the port for San Jose between San Jose and San Francisco at the beginning of California statehood. So it was a very important, vital piece of California history because there was no railroads. There was no roads. There was only commerce that went through Alviso. And so with that in mind, the attention that you need to pay to Alviso has to be with the people, not the birds. I don't care about birds. Who cares about birds, really? You know, I'm talking about the people that have been neglected historically that somehow or another Alviso is a stepchild of Sano. They are not the stepchild. They were actually the most important piece of San Jose's success. Back to council. All right, uh, back to council. Council member Cohen. Uh, yeah, thank you. And I wanna thank staff for the presentation and the work on this project. I wanna thank Michael and Tara for uh, a, a well-designed uh, project and for working with the community to uh, solve concerns. Um, I wanna thank uh, Shani and uh, Audubon Society for advocating for sensitive areas. Um, and especially as we're building uh, along the river, um, the Guadalupe River where this project is. And in Alviso, we have to be extra aware of the environmental impacts of projects like this. Um, I might have, I would have been asking a lot of questions, but you know, the the work that the Audubon Society did to uh, make sure that they get the mitigations that will help address their concerns uh, puts my mind at ease about um, the environmental impact of this project. And I'm, I'm appreciative that Tara has worked well with them. Um, this is an area of Alviso that's uh, on the south edge of Alviso where we're um, getting, getting some technical tech companies, Google's moving in um, by the end of this year to the Cisco campus area. Um, we have some businesses there. We have Top Golf, and I'm excited that we'll be uh, that Second Harvest is proposing their uh, headquarters and distribution center right next to where this hotel will be. So it's a it's an important area that's um, south of the uh, residential part of this, of Alviso that we're working very hard to preserve its character as well. So I want to um, thank uh, Shani Audubon Society and Tara for the work on this getting us to this point and uh, we'll um, be supporting the project and uh, voting against the appeal today. All right, uh, you wanna make a motion? 
I move to deny the appeal. Second. All right, motion and second. Uh, appreciate uh, all Councilmember Cohen's comments. I also want to share my thanks to Shani and the Audubon Society. And uh, <clears throat> thank you, my, thanks to Michael and his partners for their investment in San Jose. Uh, they've been investing for many years, creating a lot of jobs here. We're grateful for that, as well as for good development. All right, uh, any other comments or questions? Let the vote on the motion to deny the appeal. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay, now we're on to open forum. Um, I know there are many people who are here, and I can see from the T-shirts what you'd like to talk about. Um, so we welcome you to speak. Uh, I would again emphasize that there will not be any decision that can be made by the council at this meeting because it was not, there was no notice provided to the public that there could be any decision. So that means we, we're, we're, we're bound not to make any decisions. But uh, we will be having a hearing at which we will be making a decision. And we certainly invite you to speak then because I suspect uh, you can imagine your, uh, your comments will be more impactful at a time when we're actually making a decision. But you're welcome to speak now as well. Um, because of the, the hour, we'd like to limit everyone to a minute so we can hear everyone before this gets too late. Uh, please come on down uh, and fill out a, a car, speaker card if you haven't done so already. That way Tony can call you up one by one. Okay, Tony. I have Naomi. The, uh, I can't read the handwriting, but the first name's Naomi. And followed by Katie Lee. So again, these are, uh, when I call your name, make your way to the center, come down to the microphone. Um, first person to get to the microphone, just state your name and start speaking. So again, that's Naomi, Katie, Sean Reese, Rebecca, Kenneth, Kenneth Doe. And, and while folks are coming up, let me just reemphasize, it's Tuesday, October 25th, uh, will be at least the tentative date when we're going to have a public hearing and oh, council that. decision. That will be a public hearing at which you'll be welcome to speak as well. Uh, and if we move that date up, uh, we will notify you uh, and the community. Okay, welcome. Good evening, Mayor and the Council Members. I'm the resident of normal community, and I admire your efforts to resolve the homeless problem. That's the right thing to do. However, I think you got the wrong solution or wrong plan. Here's why. Building tiny homeless house, home on Noble Avenue would risk the safety of our kids and students, endanger the water source to the water plant, and also hindering the local people, residents, from using beloved recreation area. In addition, the area is inconvenient to homeless people anyway. So what I would appeal is that the risk with your current plan are too high. The potential benefits can be limited. So please withdraw your plan and find alternative. Please find a win-win through. Next speaker. I would also like to remind next speaker. <coughs> I would like to remind people to please say the first name that you put on your card so I know that you've spoken. Um, that way at the end, if I have leftover cards, I can call names again. Um, go ahead, next speaker. Good Mayor and committee members. My name is Sean Reese. I'm a field representative from the NorCal Carpenters Union Local 405. I'm here to talk to you about providing area standards for labor in the beautiful city of San Jose. Area standard labor language needs to be the template that developers use in this great city. I would like to express to you that without those standards, the contractor force, the construction force is systematically abused through wage theft, 1099 where workers have no workers comp when injured on the job and a litany of safety violations. The language that should become the policy here in San Jose would support responsible contractors that are already doing the right thing by their clients, employees, and the city itself. 
These responsible contractors have proven time after time that they can perform to the highest standards. This policy would bolster San Jose's working class and cultivate a responsible market for good contractors. This would create a minimum standard for developers that are coming into the city of San Jose, telling them that you value your citizens that build on our land. Adding area standard labor to the city's pre-qualification language, you will show your constituents that you value not just the city, but also the men and women building the city itself. Next speaker. Um, I'm gonna recall the names that I've already read. I have Naomi, Katie, and Rebecca. I'm also gonna add Jasmine to the list. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Whoa. Good afternoon, uh, city council members. My name is Rebecca. I am a union carpenter at Local 405. Today, I would like to uh, touch on the importance of labor standards uh, like healthcare and apprenticeship and local hire. Uh, healthcare policies make it possible for workers to rely on a safety net, ones they, ones, they, uh, ones they can depend on. Apprenticeship is also helpful because programs like this would help the members uh, boost their careers by earning an honest living wage and uh, as well as debt free educations and lead them to a successful uh, lives. Members, uh, members of our community, sorry. As more construction workers are forced to commute long hours, local hire can only help bring stability and families in the communities, ensuring workers to be able to spend time with their families. By using language like this in the future project, it would only help us to elevate this living standards of our citizens and give the working men and women the opportunity to be successful in this community we live in. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker. Kenneth. Thank you. Uh, Good evening, Mayor Licardo and Council Member. My name is Kenneth Doe. I live in San Jose for almost 40 years. I'm a member of Local Union 9144 with 2,800 members in San Jose. Tonight, I wanna to speak to you about the need for labor standards. Projects that invest in apprenticeship, prevailing wage, and health care are the best deals for our workers and the community. The South Bay needs more trained construction workers to meet the demand for the new housing and major public infrastructure projects that are in the pipeline. Labor standards will ensure contractors pay fair wages, that use experienced, well-trained workers. This leads to a higher quality workmanship, meeting building standards, and completing the project quickly. Before I go, let me leave you with this question. How can you, as a city member, better support and guard the working class, men and women of our beautiful and diverse city of San Jose. Thank you. Okay, um, so before you start, I'd also like to call Zhu Lin Peng and Han Wang down. Go ahead, please say your name. Uh, good evening, Mira and the city attorney and the city manager, the rest of the members. Okay, I know in 1972, the city began, 1972, the city began to the master plan on Lower Park and the you guys Vote yes on Noble Park is not good, okay? We stick away. And the second is close, close to the school, as you know before. Please reconsider this site. And I want to tell everyone on the meeting, on the camera, tell, tell you guys, we in the city vote for the yes on this site without public hearing and the public, uh, public uh, out research. The, it, if, if this continues, we will have your neighborhood, okay? The city will want to tell you, tell you guys, then they voted for yes. This is not called American democracy. This is called discrimination, okay? Okay, ma'am, what's your name? Okay, um, I have a lot of people lined up, but I haven't called that many names. I also have not a lot of speaker cards, so I suspect some of you may not have filled out a speaker card. Yeah. If you have not, please fill one out and give it to me, and then I will put you in the order. Um, the only two names I have left that I've called is Julin Peng and Han Wang. Yeah, if so, everyone could just fill out a yellow speaker card. That's all we ask. They're available down here and as well as at the top. Just fill it out real quickly, and that way she can call you up. Welcome. Go ahead. And I'm a resident in Novo, and uh, I'd like to ask you guys' help to work with our council member, Mr. Kohan, on alternate alternative site to replace Novo. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, number, uh, number, number one, I'd like to say we're not against tiny home, and we, we appreciate the city's effort to end homelessness. 
And uh, it's just, uh, we don't think, you know, nobody's the best site to this project. And D4 is really huge. And Mr. Kohan is the one who lives in this dis district and he knows everything within this dis district. And I don't think no one else in this council knows better than him, you know, for our district. And if he raises strong concerning to this decision and he pulls out uh, alternative, alternative sites uh, to replace Noble, which he, he already did, and I don't find a good reason for city council to ignore his input. And number two, this is uh, a parkland and uh, um, the neighborhood has been using it like every day. And last weekend, uh, um, me and my friend's family, we had a picnic at the exact location, the site. And my, my, my six year old son, Benjamin, played with, with his friends, the dogs, you know, we enjoyed it so much fun time. We even feed, you know, watermelon to a dog. It's our first time to see that in my life and okay. a little surprised. Thank you. Okay, the only name I've called that hasn't spoken is Han Wang. So Han Wang, please come to the microphone. Are you Han? Are you Han? Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the next set of people. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Mayor Ricardo and the other council members. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak for our community. My name is Hannah Wang. I came to US with my husband 20, 20 years ago. We became US citizen mostly because of American democracy system. We believed our government will listen to the opinions of people, make information transparent, safeguard the interest of the majority of the people to serve the community. But now I have doubts. First of all, as a mother of two kids, safety is our primary concern. We usually go to library and parks nearby, but as there are an increasing amount of homeless around the playground and park, we are less willing to go around that area. I have been attacked physically when I drove by an area where a tiny home was built. Please remove the plan to build 100. Thank you. Um, I have Ty Greaves, Caroline Ding, Tom Wilson, and Robert Mickinen. Thank you. Go ahead. Please say your first name. My name is Ty Greaves. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the various Citizens Advisory Council. I've been a board member for more than two decades, currently serving as secretary. Um, I speak in opposition to the siting of an emergency interim housing project on Noble Avenue. Uh, in 2017, the same site was selected. And in response to uh, citations of opposition regarding proximity to elementary schools, middle schools, the distance from any meaningful services, as well as public transportation, the planning department went back and came develop setbacks to residential and school sites and took Noble off of the list. Now, five years later, we're back. Same site, uh, and we're particularly disturbed by the surprise. An eight to two vote to move forward with this project over the objections or the request for delay. Thank you. Next speaker. My name is Caroline Ding. Um, I'm here. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm a, a Berryessa resident. I'm against the tiny house on Noble Project. Most of the homeless have medical and mental problems. They need medical help, not parks and libraries. The Noble site is close to an elementary school and a middle school. We simply cannot put the hundreds of elementary and middle school kids who walk to school every day at risk. Thank you. All right, I'd also like to add Sandra and Yadira um, to come on down. Go ahead. Good evening. My name is Robert Mickinen. Do the right thing. Save our park. Our park is not only a place of natural habitat full of wildlife. Our park is not only a place to walk and visit natural habitat and wildlife. Our park is also a place to go to and de-stress. Having this park and knowing that it's there helps calm and relax people at a time when mental illness is at an all-time high in today's society. 
Having this wonderful park helps keep people mental state in a better place. Why would any city official purposely destroy a park when that decision would add more stress to families already dealing with the everyday grind of life? Do the right thing and save parkland for animals and natural habitat. Save our park that helps the public have a place to de-stress. Save our park and promote healthy mental health. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Hi, after uh, public comments regarding the noble quick build site in last Tuesday's rules committee meeting, council member Perales said he was shocked by the level of vitriol expressed by the opposition. While he may have mistaken our anger as being stoked by some perceived fear of living among the homeless, the Barrios community's outrage is actually aimed at the city council and the mayor for their careless decision to take away a park the neighborhood has enjoyed for decades. To date, the city is building these $850,000 per door developments without a master plan, without published metrics and expected outcomes for success. We've asked for clear published criteria on what constitutes a viable site, but if it even exists, it hasn't been shared. How can you expect public support when you have not provided the proper planning needed to wisely spend hundreds of millions of dollars building at the noble? Thank you. Thank you. Um, what's your first name, sir? What's your first name? Thank you. Um, go ahead. We have a neighbor, Eric. Wait, can you state your first name? Sandra. Thank you. We have a neighbor, Eric, who sits excuse me, suggested we should include the perk ponds in our daily walks. We took him up on his suggestion and have included the beautiful, magical perk ponds in our walks ever since. Immediately, I fell in love with the natural wild landscape. I have taken I don't know how many pictures and have written several short stories inspired by my encounters with the fantastic spectrum of wildlife that thrives there. It is one of our go-to parks when friends and family come to visit. There are so many species and so many neighbors and their pets we know by name and face now because of how often we visit the park and walk the trails. I told my husband from our first visit, this place is a treasure. And we both know, and everyone here knows, that it's very much worth fighting for. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to call Canson Q. Jennifer Bullard, that's Canton to Jennifer Bullard, Yi Liao, and Hai, looks like Hai Jin Miao. Um, I'm not sure if, if I got that right because the handwriting is difficult. Um, go ahead, please state your first name. Um, my name is Yadira. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. I work for a nonprofit agency whose mission is to end homelessness and provide mental health services. As an advocate for the unhoused individuals, I understand the need and urgency to reduce homelessness. It is imperative to provide individuals with tools and resources necessary to reduce the cycle of homelessness. The proposed tiny home location does not empower individuals with the vital resources, including proximity to transportation, to maintain stable housing and break the cycle of poverty. It is imperative to keep in mind that Proximity to supportive services maximizes the strengths of individuals and builds resilient community, er, communities. As a community member, the proximity to schools and public library are also concerning. In my role as a, a service coordinator, I have witnessed several permanent supportive housing, rapid rehousing, and tiny home communities experience an increase in individual surrounding areas, causing disturbances and re Next speaker. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Member. My name is Kansen Chu. As being a resident of San Jose for 44 years, and um, I had the honor to serve the uh, Bay Area community with many of you as a City Council Member from 2006 to 2014. But today I'm here <clears throat> in my official uh, capacity as a member of Bay Area Union School District board members regarding to the city's consideration to use an open shared space near Noble Elementary School for an emergency interim housing project. The uh, board 
form, a, a letter, a formal letter from the board has been submitted to the city clerk, city clerk for your um, a record. And, and the board uh, stands behind council member David Cohen to ensure that the community input is heard and that the current use of the property is maintained for the benefit of various uh, residents. As educators, we would like to stress the importance of uh, evaluating community safety, especially safety for our children as your considered possible site across the city. We believe that EIS pro project should not be placed in close proximity to the school or place where children learn and play for their safety. Thank you very much for your time, and I respectfully ask for your uh, most favorable consideration. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Good evening, Mayor Licardo. My name is Jennifer Bullock. Good evening, council members. Um, for, I have been in the Berryessa district now for, well, over 60 years, uh, probably closer to 62. I went to, uh, to a noble school, Piedmont Middle. I go to the library. And the idea of building these interim emergency housing tiny homes is appalling. I know that we have to get the homeless off the streets. I understand that very, very fluently. But the question that has not been answered is, by building 100 tiny homes, we are in essence taking approximately 100 people, maybe a few more, off the streets. Now this is interim. This means that you, they are not gonna stay here forever. They are eventually going to be let go, set, set out, and new people are gonna be brought in. So we're not ending the homeless problem. We are only putting a Band-Aid on. Thank you, next speaker. I, I'd also like to ask Yi Kwa Wang and Emily to come on down. I'm here to urge you huh, to keep your promise five years ago huh, to stop the crazy and uh, reckless action to put a tiny home at the lower side, close to the school, to the, uh, in, the, in the park. That's the first thing. Second thing, I'm here to urge D3 and D7 councilmen. The major homeless problem is in your district. district. It's your job to reduce the, the, the homeless. Obviously, you are doing not good, so please do your job. The third, huh, New York City, uh, San, Francisco, San Francisco City, send the homeless to other cities. If you build more tiny house, you get more homeless coming. So please consider where is the homeless camp and find the root cause, solve the problem. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Hello, uh, Mr. Ricardo and all the councilmen. My name is Haiying. I have been living in Barayasa area for more than 20 years. So when I heard a few weeks ago, there is a quick move, you know, quick action from the city voted as eight versus two to have this intern uh, housing in the Barayasa area. You know, I cannot go to sleep for many, many days because I have kids. As a mom, I cannot sacrifice my kids' safety. And as a daughter, I cannot sacrifice all, all my neighbors and all my parents and seniors in this neighborhood who work daily in this park. And as a worker, I worked so hard for many years to have a house in San Jose and in Barriasa area. And I pay various different taxes to support the government and I vote, right? So I want to make sure my right got protected and there's Anything, if there's anything I cannot, can sacrifice, there's nothing I can sacrifice for my family, my kids, my parents, and my neighborhood's safety. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. I'd also like to call down Zhao Zhang and Evan. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Emily. Um, I just want to say, I uh, same with the last speaker, I was uh, so shocked. Because in our area, four elementary school, 
two middle schools and two high schools near this location. At the same time, less than 500 meters away from the select site is a concentrate of children that our country is most concerned about. As children, they are minors and they cannot provide effective protection for themselves because they need effective protection from our, go our government, parents, school district, and everyone else. Our neighbors start getting har harassment from homeless people, like stalking and asking for money, and our neighbors are scared. So what can our kids do? If something's happened to a child, children, who is responsible? Thank you, next speaker. Okay, good evening, uh, Mayor Lipado and the council members. So I believe when um, you drive in local areas, all of you sometimes see the signs saying drive like your kids live here. We also see uh, many, a lot of uh, volunteers regulating the traffic at the school entrances, right? So all of this showed that this is a, um, a city which cares the safety of the kids and put the kids' security as a top priority. That's why we love our community and uh, we love the city of San Jose. And all of us work hard to make this a better and a safer place for our kids. And then that's why we believe this is uh, a bad idea to build the, the tiny homes uh, uh, on Noble. And actually, I believe they should not be built at any location close to schools or at the uh, residential area. As a father of two kids who go to Noble Elementary School, I'm very worried about uh, the plan. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, uh, City Mayor and other uh, council members. My name is Xiao Zhan. I'm here to object Tiny Host Project on Noble Avenue on behalf of 1,277 students who attend schools within 0.4 miles of the site. If you have to build it, pretending not hear people's voice and concern, have you ever thought about those questions before you make any decision? First of all, do you take any action on protecting the kids when they have to walk past the Noble Avenue in the morning and in the afternoon to go to school or go home? Secondly, will you put any guards in the library for protecting the kids who spend their afternoon there? And lastly, it's told after tiny house being built on Bonaire and the Monterey Bay site, a lot of homeless encampment were uh, set directly across the street of this site. You can Google how it looks like now. Without access to food and medical and major public transportation in 1.5 miles radius to the noble site. What? Thank you. Next speaker, I have Christina come on down, Jessica Yang, and Tina. If the three of you could make your way to the center aisle, Evan, go ahead. Good evening, council members. My name is Evan. I'm a resident in the noble area. Uh, I am uh, against the city's decision to airdrop a homeless population in a neighborhood that they were not from. Uh, in fact, I'm here to uh, suggest that uh, it's a bad idea to airdrop any homeless site in a residential neighborhood. Perhaps a more fitting uh, decision needs to be considered and uh, perhaps the mayor uh, and the city council can come up with alternative uh, sites that are more capable of managing and helping the homeless population to learn skill. Perhaps a Google Park is a nice site for the new homeless population to stay, to give them some job training and to give them some uh, tech help to reintegrate into the San Jose Silicon Valley. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Hi, my name is Christina and I'm a San Jose resident. I appreciate the effort to end homelessness. However, I'm here to add my voice to the chorus of opposition that the Noble Avenue site is the wrong spot. This place is not only across the street from an elementary school, it is right next to a library on an existing park that is a wildlife refuge, as well as right next to a percolation pond. 
In addition, even if you were to build a site, this area is remote and inconvenient for those without cars. Therefore, even if it were built, I'm concerned that many of the tiny homes would be vacant and therefore it would not be useful. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, next speaker. Um, Mark Comfort and Richard George, make your way down. Um, um, good evening, Mayor and Council Member. I am Jessica Yang, and I am against Noble Park and also the Alvisa Hotel building. I am a resident for 35 years in the Bay Area, and this is my home. I am saddened to see open space lost over the years. The loss of wildlife and the continued degradation of our environment, the loss of nature for future families and children to enjoy. So my background is in architecture and sustainable design from UC Berkeley, and my master's degree is in environmental engineering at Stanford. I've been designing stormwater design plans in the Bay Area for three years, and I don't believe this is the right place to place the homeless shelters and the tiny houses. Instead, I think you should be building on existing already urbanized land, such as vacant lots. I fully support your efforts in the environmental impact reports for the studies in the Albiso project area. Next speaker. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me this, this opportunity. Hey, uh, my name is Lina. Thank you. Okay. I have been living here uh, in Barraza for 20 years. We escaped China from China and came to the United States because we believe our fundamental rights can be warranted in the United, in the United States. However, we are so disappointed with what you have done. I want to identify several legal issues in the procedure. First one, no public hearing had been taken when the city councils voted on the plan of tiny homes. Second one, no environmental impact report was made and released to the public. Third one, no safety investigation has been done, even though this site is a one minute walk to the elementary schools and the public library, one block away from the middle school. The city councils then voted. City's decision is baseless. We hope you can. Next speaker. And Paul, come on down. Thank you. Um, I would like to, uh, a lot of us are here because last Wednesday we were told that next Tuesday we would receive determination on the lawyers, the San Jose city lawyers interpretation of of whether or not the noble site is indeed a dedicated park space well i've spoken in my previous visits here to the council about the uh welcome to the park signs and that's a copy of one of the signs there are four of them they're at every entrance of the park somebody's somebody thinks somebody in the city specifically the city of san jose department of parks and recreation believes this to be a park as long as as well as everyone who, who lives there uh and i'll just leave it at that thank you very much what was your name thank you um next speaker and these are my last two cards that i have nope i got another one sue come on down Hello, good evening. Um, my name is Richard George, um, and I'd like to echo what the previous gentleman said. I mean, I walk my dog at the, I walk my dog there um, twice a day.
they, they hang around uh, waiting to, for their friends to get picked up from school. Next speaker. Can everybody in the back hear me okay? If you can't, just let me know and I'll speak louder. The first thing I want to say is how rude and corrupt it is for you guys to shut us off in the middle of talking. Everybody has a right to express their opinion. Now, everybody knows this is a park. Everybody knows what's going on here. Everybody should get down here and speak who feels like it. <clears throat> and everybody should run for office. Now, Noble Site is a park. Yes, it's a park. The Noble Site was dedicated as a park, as my um, fellow countrymen were saying. It's listed everywhere as a park, whether in person, at the site, or online. Looks like I only have 15 seconds left. So, as everybody's saying, it sounds like a park. It looks like a park. It's used like a park. It's a park for everyone. My six kids, myself, all my clan mates, we're here. Thank you. Next speaker. Man, uh, council members, my name is Sulin. I work for County of Santa Clara Social Service Agency before. And um, I just want, want to bring to your attention that last week, LA City Council, they approved no uh, homeless in compliments around school uh, more than 500 feet. So we are Silicon Valley. We have very intelligent people here. We cannot be high, um, you know, uh, we cannot be high than LA, right? So, and also, I don't want, you know, I don't want to change Silicon Valley from the name of Silicon Valley to Tiny Home Valley. Also, I don't want to change Golden State to Tiny Home State, okay? So, please, no Tiny Home around Noble. Thank you. Amy Chu. Good. I'm sorry, are you going online now, Tony? Yes. Okay, I, I know a lot of folks tend to filter out as we go online, so let me just say to the people who are present, again, we have an online website. We encourage you to log on to the website. If there are alternative sites that you believe you can identify that are in the district that we can explore, staff is working very hard to identify other alternatives. And they're gonna bring that analysis back to the council in a public hearing at which you'll be able to both participate and obviously hear what's going on. So as I said, tentatively, that's October 25th, uh, Tuesday, but we'll notify you if that should change if we're able to get to another site sooner. All right, Tony. Hey, go ahead, Amy. Hi, I'm here to express my concern about the decision to build emergency interim housing at Noble Park. I grew up here and now live here with my one-year-old son who I enjoy taking to the park every day. This site is completely inappropriate for an EIH project. This is important parkland which neighbors utilize heavily. Anyone who has vid visited the percolation pond can tell you it is actually one of the most beautiful parks in San Jose. In addition, the site is literally across the street from two elementary schools and a block away from a middle school and library. Children are left unattended after school as they wait for their parents around the library. The site is not close to any services or transit hubs. I strongly believe that there are many alternative locations which are better suited. Many neighbors have already made such suggestions. It is not right to quickly rush something through that will cause more damage than it will help. I ask of you to please listen to the voices of the people. Hi, my name is uh, Zijun Chen. I'm a resident of the Noble neighborhood. Pardon me for the wind noise if you hear any because I'm as I speak, I'm walking back home from the park where the city planned to build a tiny home. Literally, I watch over a dozen of my neighbors walking their dogs or jogging in the park. I watch a few kids, including my own, running in the park. I saw many ducks, gooses, and birds calling this park home. I also watched beautiful sunset just now in the park. I just cannot make sense of the decision to take all these away from our community to build tiny homes in the park. Thank you. 
Jay? Everyone knows what's going on, everyone. Oh, excuse me, I'm so sorry. Thank you, Council, for moving towards a virtual-only meeting format due to the ongoing COVID emergency. We have a ton of viruses going on right now, COVID, monkeypox, MAGA. There are many reasons to go to machines first. Klaus Schwab's the fourth industrial revolution, anyone? Now that's what I'm talking about. I mean, look, we have brain chips today. Elon is making brain chips. Neuralink, the city must partner with Elon and Neuralink and start implementing the microchip hive mind board. Why listen to public comment like these people all day when we can have brain chips and know everyone's thoughts? Who needs human connection with that? With these technologies, brain chips, AI, blockchain, we can improve traffic by harmonizing everyone's thoughts with the brain chip. When the plebs need food, their brain chip will alert us and we can deliver PB&J sack lunch with a drone. Boom, traffic solved. We need to shape a future that works for robots, robotize humanity, move beyond hearts and souls, redefine what it means to be human. Everyone knows what's going on. Everyone knows what. Vladimir? Hi, uh, I am calling to express my views on the proposed emergency interim housing site on Noble Avenue in, in District 4. Though I understand the need to find temporary homes for the unhoused, the Noble site is an inappropriate one for a multitude of reasons. First, the Noble site is parkland. Building on this site would take one of the, our most beautiful open spaces in San Jose away from the public. Second, the Noble site is situated at the easternmost edge of the city. There are no transit hubs within walking distance, no nearby grocery stores or retail, and no nearby jobs. I firmly believe that placing people on this site will place an undue burden on the would-be residents. Overall, I'm disappointed in the city's approach to transparency. It's not clear to me which sites were considered and why they were rejected. It's not obvious why each of these tiny homes will be single occupancy as opposed to housing families. Moving forward, I encourage all council members to visit every proposed site and seek alternatives when appropriate. Thank you for your time. Ryan? Yeah, so um, I think, Nobo, I'm, I'm here to um, oppose the EHI, uh, EIH project on Nobo site. Um, I looked up online and found that there is a 2006 master plan for the Penitentia Creek Trail. And this land is clearly marked as a rich two, which is that it is constructed and already improvements for as a park. And I also checked the fgparks.org site trails uh, on the Penitentia Creek trail this area is dedicated mark in light green which is also shown as a park so um there are also like uh, 135 identifiers have found like 84 species in this land this area is like one mile away from alarm rock where lives like more than 700 species of wildlife and 15 of them are already in danger i think this is critical Yangji. Good evening, council members. This is Yang Zi. Uh, regarding building the EIH site by the Noble Elementary, uh, the bottom line I want to emphasize is that uh, there should be a minimum buffer distance between a homeless site and any school. So the proposed tiny home position is actually besides a library, three schools, and one daycare. So this is very concerning. So I will echo the point of the previous speakers. Uh, such a homeless site should not appear in any residential area. The proposed position actually will also occupy an established park that local residents and kids will visit daily. So this will kind of like depurpose this park and the trail as well. The city has spent so much money and resources to maintain it. So this is pounding our tax money into water. I would strongly urge the city not to rush into such a reckless decision. Sarah? Hi, Mayor, Council Member. Uh, I'm calling from uh, my vacation that I booked a few months ago. Uh, this is my first, I couldn't join today's meeting, so I'm calling. This is our fifth uh, public meeting we have uh, attended to address this reckless uh, idea from our city council. And uh, uh, I think I want to uh, mention a few things. Well, well, uh, this is not democracy, this is a uh, dictatorship because you guys said that because it's an emergency, you can bypass any criteria. So this is ridiculous, this is dictatorship. Another thing is um, I read from our mayor's opinion on newspapers that it's, uh, there's a doubt whether this is a park. This is another ridiculous 
uh, idea because this is a park. We use the park every day, and uh, uh, we uh, the city maintain the park. The city um, put the signs there. Vivian. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Vivian. Uh, I'm a resident of District 4, Berryasa area. But actually, I live very close in working distance to the Mulberry tiny home. And uh, District 3 councilman said a lot of good things about the tiny home set. But in reality, I want to let you know that the crime rate near my home did increase after the tiny home was built several years ago. And my house was breaking and I saw weird people coming to our community. And also my neighbor said his door was knocked by some strangers at 3 a.m. in the morning, twice in a few months. And uh, if tiny home are safe, then there is no need for 24 hour security, but we were told there is 24 hour security. The, I want to oppose to S. Okay, back to council. Okay, uh, I think we are done with this meeting. Let's adjourn. Or we can put that guy back on who was singing. <laughs>